afternoon and welcome to uh, the committee's second evidence session in, in our inquiry into leasehold reform. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'll just ask committee members to put on record any particular interest they may have that may be relevant to this inquiry. I'm a vice president of the local government association. Perhaps just go around the table. That's uh, my register of interests. I employ a councillor in my office. Um, I employ a councillor in my office. I'm a vice president of the local government association under the leasehold. Councillor, as per register of members' interests. I'm a vice president of the local government association. <coughs> uh, I employ, employ a councillor in my office and I also have connections with industry that are fully declared in the register of members' interests. And the property which is subject to leasehold. I'm the vice president of the LGA. I'm a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. Right. Okay, thank you very much for coming uh, to give evidence to the committee this afternoon. Could we just ask you to go just down the table and say who you are and the organisation you're representing today? Hi, I'm Peter Jenkinson from Pissum and Horns. Uh, Jason Honeyman, CEO of Bellway Homes. We build around 10,000 homes uh, per annum across the country. Um, I'm Jenny Daly, I'm the Group Operations Director of Taylor Wimpy. Um, I sit um, as an executive board member and also a member of Taylor Wimpy PLC. Okay, thank you for coming to the committee this afternoon. Um, just the, the first question. Um, you, as companies, all sell leasehold properties, um, and I think many of them will have clauses in um, the contracts about escalating ground rents. Um, how do you justify those clauses? Do you want me to kick off? Yes, please. Um, what the problem is, I suppose, there's no real definition what an onerous ground rent is. Um, if you look at it and you look at the definitions, there's not really there any definition of what onerous is or a definition of what new build is. Um, that's led to a bit of confusion around the numbers and it's led a bit of confusion around the scale of the problem. And that confusion has led a little bit of confusion to the customer. Personally, my own view of what an onerous ground rent would be is the one which materially affects the customer's ability to sell or, or to um, dispose of their home. Personally, I'm not aware of any persimmon leases that where that's the case, so I'm not really sure where the definition comes from. Can I just add to that, Chair? We, uh, as Bellway, we don't have any onerous leases. Our standard lease is based upon a rent review based on RPI, which is acceptable to all the main lenders, so we haven't got any complaints with regard to onerous leases. I think this uh, I'd, I'd sort of echo what uh, Dave has said. Where a ground rent, where a ground rent value becomes disproportionate to the value of the home, I think that's where you capture a, an onerous or a defective lease. Right, but why an escalation at all? Because you're not doing more for collecting more money, are you? Well, well, I think uh, the purpose of an RPI increase is an indice that's acceptable to the lenders. And the, uh, the purpose, as I understand it, is to ensure that the ground rent at the time of purchase is the same in real terms at some point in the future. That's the but idea. why? You're not doing more for it? No, but it's just an indice that's acceptable to the lenders. Yeah. So is, it, is it acceptable to the person who's buying the property? That's surely the test. It's a good question. Um, I think the purpose is simply to design that the value at the point of sale is in real terms the same value in 25 year time uh, 25 years time that's the idea really and it's been question, common but maybe go back what more you're doing to actually bring more money in but then perhaps we'll develop an answer now yeah. uh, th thank you chair firstly um, i welcome the opportunity to appear um, before the committee today um, both to repeat our apology um, to those customers who have been affected by a very specific lease that Taylor Wimpy um, have historically, uh, which was a 10-year doubling ground rent um, lease, and also if um, I have the opportunity to explain the measures that Taylor Wimpy um, have taken to date and are taking um, to help resolve that issue for our customers. We'll, we'll come back to the compensation scheme yes. in due course. Right. Um, in, in respect of the um, of ground rent and uh, just picking up on the matters of, of um, RPI, um, the expectation is that that's merely to an, uh, an RPI index is merely to reflect the the progressive value of uh, value of money. Right, not necessarily the value of what you do, but anyway, that's uh, nobody's managed to explain that quite yet. 
Um, right, so I go into one of your sales room um, and I buy a property freehold uh, as opposed to leasehold. Do I get charged more for that property if it's freehold? If, if I can, can answer no. that, um, um, I think it's important to differentiate between houses and, and apartments. And, right, well, let's start on, on, on houses then, because yeah. there, there is clearly properties that sold both freehold and leasehold of a similar nature. Yeah. So the expectation would be that um, you would pay, a customer would pay more for a freehold property than a leasehold uh, mm. property. Right. So uh, a customer comes into your show, um, showrooms and wants to buy a property. You offer them two different prices, do you, for freehold and leasehold? Well, we no longer sell um, houses. Well, you did in the past, did you? We, we did in the past, and um, a, a property would have been offered leasehold, and there would have been potentially a separate premium for the freehold. Okay. And Can I give you an example of that? Yes. I mean, we're the, we're the same as uh, Taylor Wimpy in that regard. So if you was in Newcastle, uh, there are only certain areas in the country that um, seem to have leasehold homes, predominantly in the now northwest and some parts of the northeast and obviously in very central parts of uh, central London. But if you was to come into uh, uh, a home in Newcastle, say, and you was to, wanted to buy a home for around 1,000 square feet, you could buy that £196,000 on a, a leasehold basis. And if you wanted to acquire the freehold, it would cost you around £200,000. And that could, That's done, the sort of that, difference. that could be done at the same time. You go in and choose, could you? Which, which, which sort of arrangement you had? Not today, but you could uh, in 2016 when we were selling leasehold And houses. that was clearly advertised to anyone coming in to buy a property from yeah. you, was it? Our group instructions to all our sales offices are to offer either leasehold or freehold. Right. Mm. That wasn't the case of this. I mean, what we would do was have, once we decided the site was going to be leasehold, the site would be sold, leasehold, and it would all be, have a lease. Right. If we saw the house was going to be freehold, the only exception to that rule would be if it was an apartment, and an apartment would have a ground rent to do with the management of the building. But the right. houses would Sorry, be just to come again. You, you, so you didn't sell properties leasehold and freehold on the same site? Then? Not houses, which is, was your specific yeah. question. If you want to ask, did we ever have sites where we sold apartments? And no, no, I'm talking about houses now. Houses, we didn't have that, no. So you just sold them leasehold? Yes, the only exception to that came a little bit later when we decided to stop selling freehold. Stop selling leasehold. Leasehold, sorry, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you just had leasehold sales. Yes. Full stop. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you change, you've changed now to just sell freehold, uh, and that means you've changed, you've increased the price of those properties, have you? Accordingly. We would did depend upon prevailing market conditions. What we did, if we had a large site, for example, um, we'd come for a logical area where we'd finish selling leaseholds, and the balance of the site was sold as freehold houses. We looked at the price at that time and increased the price of them freehold units by about two to three thousand pounds per unit. Um, and the leasehold ones, we didn't sell any more on that side. So, what, what calculations do you all do about the difference between freehold and leasehold when you're selling? What's what, what's the percentage difference? The percentage of uplift in freehold property? And how do you calculate it? It it does it does vary. Uh, sorry, Jenny. It does vary, but typically it would be you know, 20 times the annual grand rent. That would be a typical calculation we would do in valuing the freehold. Right. When, when we converted um, to freehold, um, and uh, I would explain that, that we really only sold leasehold properties in the northwest of England, where it was established custom and practice um, to sell on a leasehold basis, then, then we set a premium that, that was roughly around um, the 20 times 5,000, um, 5,900 pounds that um, Jason has um, has referred to. And when we, we made that change, then uh, for freehold, the, the property prices were increased. Very simple. Right, so if anyone wants to come along and buy um, the freehold from you then, all they have to do is pay 20 times the ground rent, is that right? Well, we'll talk about what we've done later, but that's similar. We've got a policy on them now. Uh, uh, yeah, um, any freehold that Taylor wouldn't be uh, retained, um, particularly when we were uh, transitioning from leasehold to freehold, we made a commitment to those customers that we would hold that freehold for a period of no less than five years uh, and that it would be available for them to buy at a specific price. So 20 times ground rent would be what you'd offer with if someone came to you to buy their... To buy their freehold? 
we've got a company policy on that. I'm not going to talk about that now, what we've done to help the customers or whether you want to talk about it later. I'm quite happy to answer the question at any time. Well, we can look at the compensation issue, but I'm just saying, if you've done the calculation about the difference in no, price... Our policy you know, that we introduced, it will be the lesser of the market value of the ground rent or 25 times the multiple. 25 times? Or the market value of the lesser of the two. So if it was to come in at 15, they would get it for 15. If it was to come in at 10, they would get it at 10. We knew we capped that figure, and it's actually in the leases at 25 times. And we set a specific price. What, what we still haven't had, though, is uh, an explanation of what you collect ground rent for. What, what do you actually give to the householder you know, in return for this money you're taking from them? I, I think in, in respect of um, leasehold houses, um, I, I think that that's a fair question. And it is you know, one of the reasons that when um, these matters um, came um, to our attention at the sort of autumn 2016, we made the very quick decision um, to to convert um, the homes that we sell to, to freehold so you don't in the north west. Anything, then, um, but we believe that they're unnecessary for leasehold houses in the majority of, of circumstances. Right. So you were embarrassed into abandoning them then, because uh -huh. you didn't justify them. As I said, Chair, it was established custom and practice, particularly in the northwest of England. Um, we, we did it to remain competitive. When the matter was brought to our attention, it was something that we were uncomfortable with, and we made that quick decision because we, we believed it was unnecessary in the, um, in the case of houses. So, Taylor Wimpy haven't got any reason to collect the ground rent they can't justify. What about Belway? Well, the only tangible benefit is to buy a home at a lower price from the outset. There is no other benefit, Chair. So, uh, it's just how I described uh, yes. the, the price differential at, at the beginning. Yeah. And that's the only tangible benefit I can offer. Yeah. See, we had witnesses from Persimmon who came to talk to us who said, uh, well, we, we bought the property leasehold, they wouldn't sell it any other way. But then when they sold the freehold properties on the next phase, because they changed the policy, the prices weren't any different. I don't know which site that actually no. was. I could, I could guess which one it possibly is. That's not well, the... Well, quite a few people complained yeah, about it. That's so not, that's, well, yeah. I imagine it was Harrow, was it? No, I yeah, think it's no. actually known that's, it? Well, that's not the company policy. I can assure yeah. you that the company policy could not have been clearer. When we stopped building on a particular phase that the instruction went out, that they would increase the price on the balance of the site. Theresa? When you sold houses, new build houses as leasehold, was that under the help to buy scheme? Um, I've looked at our uh, records and um, in respect of leasehold houses, and I, I would repeat that for Chair Wimpy that was predominantly in the northwest of England, um, we had um, about 2.7% of our leasehold houses were sold under help to buy. What about? Yeah, uh, if I could give you it sort of in context, in thousands really. So. We, we wouldn't differentiate for a buyer whether you're paying, buying cash or whether you're helped to buy. Uh, but, but the help to buy scheme had to be an approved developer to be under the help to buy scheme. Yeah, so, yes, so, so for would, sure. Would they have been helped to buy properties you sold? Yeah, for, yeah all, all properties would be helped to buy that, that um, are categorised or, or fit within the criteria. So I, I would guess uh, we sold around 4,000 homes across a five or six year period uh, on leasehold and I would, is a best guess because looking at the, the, the shape of the business that around a third of those would have been on a help to buy basis. Okay, thank you. Just so you understand, when we were developing a site, once we decided it was going to be a leasehold site that didn't distinguish between help to buy or any normal form of sale, whether it was a mortgage without help to buy or whether it was a cash purchaser for that matter. So wherever it was a leasehold purchase, then when a customer but, but used help to buy, then it would be a help to buy sale okay. for the leasehold. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Kevin. Yeah. Um, I accept that it's, it's kind of custom and practice in the northwest to have leasehold properties, but um, one of the problems seems to be the level of the charge. Can you just say what you were charging typically on a leasehold house, say, before you changed your practices? What were you charging typically? So just... For, for what was the annual ground rent? The ground rent, the ground rent would have varied. Um, in Just typically, of, um, somewhere between uh, um, one hundred and fifty and two hundred and ninety pounds. So say it's average of two hundred, two hundred and fifty. 
Yeah, we, we uh, always say around 200 pounds is the passing ground rate. Yes. Oh, yeah. Very similar. Yes. 200 pounds. And what would it have been 10 years ago, that figure? It was broadly similar. 200 pounds. Two, two, uh, 200 pounds a year, 10 years ago. 20 years ago? I, I'm unaware of what I'd be language. guessing if I... Um, Could you let us know? Could you write to us and let us know what yeah. you were charging, say, 20 years ago? Because it seems, is it not the case in your own... View, the, 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 the level of the ground rent seems to have gone way I've been dealing with ground rent with leasehold properties for many years in my life prior to the Parliament. And the ground rent used to be pretty much peppercorn. Yeah, they seem to have recent years just gone through the roof. And it, the only explanation you can see around that, because as the chair said, there's no tangible work that goes, especially for a leasehold house, that it just seems like a, a kind of um, a, a side door into a profit opportunity. Is that is that ref, a fair reflection of where we've been? Um, as I say, in respect of leasehold houses, um, we, we have taken the decision that is unnecessary. But you, do you, on, you feel, is it fair to say that the level of ground rent uh, increased well beyond the level that was fair? Um, as I've indicated, I think that it was broadly similar 10 years ago, and, and I'm only able to comment 20 years ago, but we'll take away your question and, and re reply. I, I'm certainly not in, in aware of any sort of step change in ground rent uh, in the past 10 years, but again, I'll, I'll look into it and see if we can see some correlation over the past decade or two. Two decades would be great, yes. It's a valid question, I'll come back to you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mary. Um, we, thank you. We heard evidence uh, that up to 80% of um, homes, new homes in the northwest, were um, being built and sold with leaseholds attached to them. Um, this seems to have, we seem to be thinking that it's custom and practice. It's always been done that way. Um, given where we are now, inquiring into it and, and some of the um, changes that have been made by Taylor Winfrey, is it still an appropriate model? Well, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with a leasehold tenure. It's been used for a, a very long time, providing you've got a fully marketable lease. So personally, I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with a leasehold tenure, particularly for apartment blocks. And I think we're also discussing today. I, I don't know if that answer, answers your question at all. So if, for apartments, more so than for housing? For, yeah, certainly, yeah. I would agree with Jason on that point. Um, I think a lot just depends upon the situation of each individual site, really, but I agree with Jason. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, would you uh, With respect to leaseholders, based on the evidence sessions and the roundtables that we've been involved in, uh, I can, uh, uh, I think, um, inform you that there are a lot of unhappy people out there. Uh, but uh, you know that's just to put it mildly. Um, but we just you know, let, let's look into the compensation schemes uh, with respect to ground rent. Now, last week, one leaseholder accused developers of offering, uh, and I quote, as little as they can possibly get away with to compensate leaseholders affected by onerous ground rents. Now, is that a fair assessment uh, analysis in in uh, in your opinion? Well, if I could answer that on the basis that Taylor Wimpy does have a voluntary assistance scheme uh, for our customers um, who were affected by a, a specific 10-year doubling ground rent um, clause, um, we took the matter extremely seriously um, when it um, was brought to our attention around autumn 2016. And um, I think the reason for that timing is that um, the leases that, that we created with that um, specific clause um, uh, was used on new developments between 2007 and 2011, was coming up for its first doubling and was starting to cause um, concerns to, uh, to customers. We did act very swiftly. Um, we talked about uh, Taylor Wimpy's decision uh, right at the very start of um, 2017 to move away from uh, the sale of uh, leasehold homes or houses um, uh, uh, in favour of freehold. We also, um, having um, undertaken a sort of a detailed internal review, established a provision of 130 million, uh, which we announced in April 2017, and we've engaged with uh, freeholders. Um, to provide um, umbrella or framework agreements such that um, uh, our customers with that particular um, uh, ground rent clause are able to convert their lease from the 10-year uh, doubling clause to an RPI. 
Um, it has been a, a slow process, but we have engaged, um, I think, uh, quite well with the, uh, the freehold um, sector. Um, I'm um, able to, to um, confirm that we have agreements with freeholders that represent 95% of those leases. Uh, we are in um, uh, detailed and advanced legals uh, with um, freeholders representing a further 2% um, of those leases and uh, we're still in active negotiation with freeholders representing um, that very small balance. Um, we have been uh, managing the scheme now uh, for um, a year, um, having announced the first um, agreements with freeholders um, in September, October last year. And whilst I would accept that progress has been slow, um, it has been gaining momentum and we have been um, converting a material number of leases um, now to um, an RPI uh, lease and we will continue to do so. I, I will come on to that uh, yes. RPI aspect mm -hmm. later on as well. But Mr Tinkinson, what, what do you think? Well, my issue is we, we identified a problem mainly with the vent charges back in 2014 and the company made a decision to not dispose of any um, ground rents to any third party, so we haven't made any disposal since 2014. We've held them within the business to ensure our customers got treated fairly to do with them. Once it became clearer than after that, we also wrote to all our customers in July 17 and offered them a right to buy. Any, so any of the ground rents which we'd, which we'd materialised since 2014, we offered each customer an opportunity to right to buy that individual ground rent after two years. That ground rent was going to be at the, the lesser of 25 times the ground rent or the market value of the rent at the time. Interestingly, not that many people have actually taken up since that offer. Only 160 people have actually taken that offer up. I think once they knew they could buy that for such a for the, for the sum, which equates to roughly 0.5% to 1.5% of the value of the property, they didn't want to take it up. They just wanted to know the comfort of it. Um, secondly, we've controlled the event charges in there, so there can never be more than £250 for a minor, ex major extension. Minor issues are free and structural are £75. We also put these clauses into future leases, not just to protect our current customers, but the ones beyond the first sale. Um, and thirdly, we reviewed all our leases that we had, that we owned to and see if there was any what we considered to be owner leases, owner's leases. We identified 60 potential leases where we had a problem and we wrote to all our customers and we changed their leases to a term that were acceptable at, at no cost to them. Okay, Mr Honeyman? Yeah, I'd, um, uh, similar to Dave really, we don't experience the level of complaints that sometimes I read in the press across our group. Um, over the past few years we've had uh, 142 divisional complaints about leaseholds We've had 18 at a group level, and I can only put that down to the fact that we don't have, as a business, any defective leases. We don't have the, uh, the onerous leases that Jenny's uh, referred to. All of ours are subject to RPI, and hence the lenders are willing to lend on that basis. The majority of complaints that we've experienced have all centred around consent fees and the cost of acquiring uh, uh, the ground rent in the future. Okay, well, I, I, as I said, I will come back to RPI later on, but let me reassure you that uh, we uh, have you know, experienced lots and lots of complaints uh, in the evidence sessions. Uh, so somewhere along the line, uh, our uh, uh, things are not quite corroborating. But okay, let, let's go to, in terms of Taylor Wimpy, um, you know, during our last session, uh, Chair, we actually had um, you know, a discussion about the Taylor Wimpy, the, the ground rent uh, review assistance scheme. Yes. Uh, and that was actually criticised for having paid out only £11 million out of the £130 million that was reportedly set aside. Um, now, as well as being very, very slow and very, being very difficult to understand, so shouldn't you really revisit how that scheme works? Um, firstly, um, the, um, the figure repair, referred to the 11 million was a, a point in time and reported for accounting purposes in, in July um, to, the, to the city. I don't think um, that reporting um, on our sort of progress 
um, on the um, utilisation of the provision is necessarily the best indicator for members as to the progress that we have made. And we have made substantial um, uh, progress. Um, we have expended or utilised a significantly um, greater figure than, um, th than has been identified. Uh, we have um, had uh, a, a significant number of, of our uh, customers apply. As I say, we have had um, over 2,200 deeds of variation now completed. Um, we have a significant number of customers in the system. Um, it, it is a complex uh, process. We have sought on behalf of our customers to take as much, much of the complexity out of that as possible. Um, so we have worked with the freeholders to agree um, that framework agreement. Um, we have set up, uh, through external solicitors, um, a, a legal hub that will assist um, the customer um, and their solicitors. We have a customer-facing team who will assist customers. We have a website with um, readily understandable FAQs. We do, however, have a meaningful number of customers in our system who have, for reasons of their own, and uh, we can see that there has been uh, a meaningful number um, choosing to pause their applications while the government's consultation is in, in train. We can process applications in um, somewhere between eight to ten weeks. We have achieved um, conversions much faster than that. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. We have a number of solicitors, the freeholders, lenders and management companies, but we are um, determined to resolve um, this matter on behalf of our customers. We have um, indicated no end date um, on that uh, scheme and we will continue to work hard on their behalf. Okay. Well, uh, Taylor Wimpy seems to be ahead of the curve on, on this particular aspect. So, gentlemen, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Bellway and Persimmon, do you actually have any uh, similar plans to introduce uh, such compensation I schemes? I don't think ahead of the curve is quite the right line. I think no. behind, behind the curve almost, because we're not in that position, we didn't have the leases exactly the same as them. As I said, we weren't in the same position as them, so we didn't have to carry out the same actions, but we didn't rest on our merits. We noted back in 2014 there was an issue with event charges, therefore we didn't sell the freeholds. They were actually kept by us, therefore third parties weren't able to charge the amounts which has caused so much concern. Also, we haven't just done that, we've gone much further than that. We've introduced a right to buy to our customers. So if they want to buy that freehold, they can buy it off us at the lesser of market value or 25 times. Right. And you know, what other compensation schemes are, uh, are you looking to introduce? We, we, uh, we haven't got any onerous leases, so we haven't got that level of complaint uh, that, that Taylor Wimpy have. So we just haven't got that volume of uh, complaints coming through our, our business. All of our leases are perfectly marketable, as they would be on an, uh, an apartment scheme. So I, I just don't have that problem. Okay, fair, uh, fair enough. Obviously, it's, it's there for the record. Uh, but um, you know, let's, let's come back to the issue about the R RPI. Now, some developers have made offers to leaseholders to convert... Uh, the doubling grant rent uh, clauses to one that actually increases at the rate of uh, RPI. Now, is that really a better deal for leaseholders? Mr. Jenkinson? It depends on who actually controls the, um, the freehold itself. Personally, I don't think that's the real issue, whether it's RPI or doubling. It's more important because you if you're doubling two pound, for example, or maybe four pound, what's more important is the starting amount and where it ends up with and where it's capped. Mm -hmm. And the crux of this whole point is, do they have a marketable product at the end and does it materially affect the value of that customer's house? We don't believe we have leases like that. However, for, if anybody was to bring a lease like that to me, I'm more than happy to look at it. I'm more than happy to deal with it personally and have a look at it. I just don't believe, similar to Jason, I don't believe we have them leases. So uh, you, know, you, you don't mind whichever one, whether it's the, ground, uh, the doubling ground rent clauses or uh, whether it's at the rate of RPI. Um, From Persimmon's experience, that's not what really worries customers. What worries the customers how much they've actually got the cost to buy the freehold. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we had uh, one person in terms of giving uh, written evidence, uh, and uh, they said that uh, you know, I must sign away my rights, and I quote, to take any further action. Uh, and that was actually against Taylor Wimpy and, and be prepared to have RPI increases for the entire length of, of the lease. Some offer 
the current doubling uh, lease terms provide the freeholder with a ground rent in excess of £800,000 for the term of the lease. Uh, the proposed changes to RPI generates ground rent in excess of £2.2 .2 million for the term of the lease. Uh, how can this be judged as a good offer? And, and in a very uh, well put. So, so w w what do you think? Um, well, there, there are a few points that, that you've raised there, if I may. Um, the first is in respect of um, what, what's known as the settlement agreement, um, to which the, the customer is referring. Um, it, it is not a, um, a, um, a requirement um, to sign away the rights. Um, the settlement agreement has been defined on the most narrow terms, um, which which we we have set on the most narrow terms that addresses only and very specifically the doubling ground rent um, provision clause. It in no way prohibits or would prevent any customer from seeking a legal remedy on any other matter to do with their lease or indeed um, to third parties. Um, so I, I'm quite happy to uh, provide committee with a copy of the settlement agreement. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, it's a single A4 page, and, and we have made that point uh, um, with great clarity um, to customers who are concerned. Uh, regarding RPI, um, RPI is by far um, the, um, the most significant um, uh, lease in the residential um, leasehold um, sector. Um, it's readily understood. Um, we uh, talked earlier about preserving effectively the value, um, the value of money. If a, a, a lease is set at £150, then effectively RPI reflects what um, that um, uh, would, be, would be worth um, in years hence. Um, the issue with the doubling ground rent was specifically around the affordability of that ground rent. Um, the, um, the clause only doubled five times. There was only five um, review events, but the escalation was a matter of some concern to our customers, which we entirely understand um, and, and, and felt that, that we should respond to. Um, in re returning them to an RPI lease, we've effectively returned them to a lease that would have been the case had we not introduced the doubling ground <coughs> rent and is um, the lease of preference um, by, by the sector. So you know, I think that really we've put them on a level playing field with the vast majority of leases in the residential leasehold sector. Okay. And for the record, Mr Honeyman, what, what are your views on this particular issue? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> sorry, I feel like I'm... Uh, Always trying to blame Jenny for the, the the problem, but it's the doublers that are the problem. Our lease is our standard lease from Bellway is CML compliant, which is the Council for Mortgage Lenders, mm -hmm. and it's accepted by all the main lenders. So we don't experience the problems that you're you're referring to. All our leases are, are perfectly marketable, and it's a very similar lease to the one that we use for our apartments, where we don't experience any problems. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. I just want to clarify the understanding from each each of your perspective. I understand, Mr. Honeyman, that, that maybe this doesn't apply to the Bellway, but, but certainly from uh, Jenny and David's perspective, it's the, the principle of the doubling. I just want to confirm. If the ground rent starts at, say, uh, as I referred to, a ground rate typically of 200, 200 pounds, after 10 years, that becomes 400, after 20 years, it becomes 800 and thereafter up to 50 years when it comes 6,400. There are companies out there that double the, the, the uh, ground rents after five years. So you actually get to your uh, 6,400 after 25 years. Um, what's your understanding of what your companies classify as the doubling of ground rent? Um, I, I'm referring specifically to a lease that Taylor Wimpy introduced um, in 2007. Um, to new developments up until 2011, which was a 10-year doubling ground rent lease. We don't have... So every year. 10 years, the ground rent would double. So yes. starting at £200, after 10 years it would go up to £400. That's correct. After 20 years, £800 and mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And as I've said, we were uncomfortable with that and we've introduced the voluntary assistance scheme um, to resolve the matter for us. We have some doubling ground rents. It's important to understand why that came about. It was to do with the customers wanting certainty what they were going to pay in the future. But they're capped. So the actual amount of money that it works out 
works out the same as if it was RPI'd or, or, or near as could be expected to be. There's none of our ground rents at all. So, so how can you predict what RPI is going to be? Well, you can't. That was why some of the customers would rather have certainly what yeah. the new payment was going to be. But the, what we didn't oh, want so to you do was so keep doubling. No, that was capped, so it doubled. When it reached £1,200, for example, it was capped, it couldn't go any higher. Right, OK. OK, thank you. I just okay. want to clarify just that. Very briefly, I think you're, you're saying that you haven't got onerous ground rent arrangements because they're linked to our RPI. So you're all saying if ground rent increases are linked to RPI, they're not onerous. As and my, my personal view, there's no definition. I'm, I think it depends. That's your where, it, no, it depends where your starting point is with RPI. If it was a ten thousand pound ground rent, it was RPI linked, and it would probably affect the value of the house. If it was a hundred thousand pound, what I'm seeing to be clear, I think it's with anything which materially affects the marketability of that house. Mr. Hunman? I think if you've got a modest ground rent that's on uh, with a rent review at 10 years on RPI, I think it's perfectly acceptable. Um, I, my, my view would be that um, there are very specific legal and financial accounting definitions around onerous, which, which I, I'm not um, qualified to, um, to advise the committee. What I can say is the 10-year doubling ground rent lease that Taylor won't be introduced is not um, uh, consistent with um, our high standards of customer service and we felt um, uncomfortable and wished to uh, work um, on behalf of our customers to resolve the matter. A lead job, yeah, it isn't onerous. Uh, I think... Um, well, that's your definition, isn't it? It isn't onerous if you've got a ground rent increase linked to RBI. I think it's a, it's a, a combination of factors, as I've said, I'm not legally qualified to advise members on um, the definition of, well, I think you of can what, tell the what is onerous. Whether, whether you think your arrangements are onerous or not. I think the government's work on um, looking no, at I'm asking for your view, not the government's view. Um, my view is that um, owners has some very specific definitions in legal and right. financial terms. Okay. We're uncomfortable about the double in ground rent that we introduced and we are working to resolve So, linked to RPI, your ground rent arrangements are not onerous? The RPI um, form of lease that we're returning our customers to, I am satisfied, is marketable and saleable and affordable. And it's not onerous? It's not onerous. And that goes for your arrangements as well? And the two companies? As I said previously, there's no definition of what an owner's ground lease is. You've asked me what I think it is. My personal view is if it's a lease which affects the marketability of the house, then I think that's right. onerous. Sorry, can I come back on? Yeah, just briefly. Sorry, yes, Chair. We're, I'm satisfied that our lease is CML compliant. It's um, satisfactory for our purchasers and it's fully marketable. So I just want to come back on this issue of what, what definition of owner is, because, uh, uh, Mr. Jenkinson, as you're quite rightly saying, it's whether it's marketable or not. Would you accept the marketability is depending on the lenders being, being willing then to lend money for the purchase of that property? I couldn't agree more. I think that's a perfect assessment. Good. That's why okay. you have to go to the, com the commercial. So the definition of that is 0.01% of the value of the property. If, if the ground rent is above that, it's considered onerous. By that the was the nationwide lenders. rules that they introduced. If yep. you actually have a look at what the CML rules says itself, it says on affordability, lenders need to establish if the lease will have an impact on the borrower's affordability. It is a regular requirement for lenders to take account of all known future charges. As such understands of the levels of ground rent, how the increase of the mortgage term and other known charges due under the leasehold agreement are relevant to a lender's assessment of affordability. If ground rents or other charges have an impact on the value and the saleability of the property, this needs to be taken into consideration in deciding whether how much the land. That's basically saying if that ground rent, due to its terms and conditions, affected the saleability of that property, then they shouldn't lend on it. To me, that is a reasonable assessment. If if any of our ground rents had a criteria in that, it had to have been valued in accordance with them conditions, and therefore they wouldn't have been able to lend so on it. So if any of your customers, because they're still your customers because they're, they're leasehold, leaseholders as opposed to freeholders, can't get uh, a mortgage or can't sell their property because other people can't get a mortgage because of the ground rent issue, you would accept that that's an onerous I totally accept that point and if I was, I'm more than happy to look into it. I've had okay, a look so over the last two years how many of these we've had. Well, okay, so, uh, uh, so uh, well, I'm, I'm happy that you're, yeah, you're prepared I'm to do that because that, we've yeah. got lots of evidence from your, um, your customers saying that they can't sell their properties. I'm more than happy to look at that for you individually. Okay, fine. Right, finally, before I go to Mark, just <laughs> back to Taylor Wimpy, um, you spent more than 11 million on your scheme. How yes. much? 
Um, it, it's it, um, over three times that in terms of what we've utilised, and then we have a, a significant amount that's impending. Can you, can you, if you haven't got a figure immediately to hand, can you let the committee have a figure? I'd be happy to write to committee, yes. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh. Let's look at the government's proposals for reforming ground rents. Uh, the proposal at the moment is to cap that at £10. We've had a number of uh, written and oral evidence pieces provided to us. This could have adverse impacts, but as builders, what impact would a £10 cap on ground rents have on house building? Can I uh, answer that in the first instance? So, um, to put a £10 cap on everything may be a blunt instrument to apply to all. And the reason I say that is because certainly some apartment blocks that I build in London are quite complex. So, you'll have 25 storeys, you'll have subterranean central heating plants, you've got concierge services, gymnasiums, <coughs> yoga rooms, all sorts of facilities within that envelope and to attract, to charge just a £10 ground rent to a complex building that needs a specialist to manage that building for the uh, long term is probably too low, but it may work on, you know, a low rise block of, uh, say, 12 or 15 apartments without all the complexities of it. So I certainly support um, a calculation for a ground rent. but. The complexity and the, the, the style of the building, I would suggest, that to be taken into account. Presumably, a lot of the things you just described would actually be covered by a service charge. Yes, it would, but it's the quality of the freeholder uh, as well. So you'd, you wouldn't want um, an inexperienced freeholder man managing a building, being responsible for firefighting lifts and the like in a complex high-rise building. Um, in that instance, and I don't think you're going to create sufficient investment value to attract the quality investors for long-term management. But would it affect the actual house building numbers? W would it affect? Would you build fewer? Yeah. Would it? Would I build fewer? No, I. I, I don't think so. No, I'd, I'd be. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. What about you? Um, I, I, I would agree that the level of, um, sort of income from um, the sale of freeholds is, is relatively small against um, our, main, our main business of selling homes. Um, I think I would share the, the, the concern around um, the uh, sort of incentive for a professional freeholder to be involved in, in buildings of, of, sort of certain typologies that are complex. Um, and would uh, reconfirm the discussion that we just had, really, which is the important thing is um, that it's clear, appropriate, and fair um, and transparent from a customer's um, perspective. Do you're happy with the £10? Um, I think it introduces um, issues, as I say, um, in, in respect of the incentive for freeholders to remain involved in the sector, um, particularly for, for complex um, uh, uh, buildings, but we, we will conform to um, whatever the government's um, outcomes of their, the consultation. But a typical housing state in which you, know, you have detached properties, uh, how complex does it have to be? Um, well, we've already moved away from any um, sale of leasehold houses where we have the ability to do so, um, so that's, that's not likely to be an issue. Um, and as I've said, it's not a significant um, income for Taylor Wimby. Okay. What about the cinema? I have no problem at all, at all with a ten pound, and I think a lot of the things that Jason was talking about could be dealt with through a management company anyway. And as, and as for effective production, I don't think it would have any impact at all. And some of the witnesses that we have written to us, have, you know, have come out with a number of other things uh, that would be adverse as such. Other other aspects. I mean, Mr. Hanman, you've suggested this might impact on complex, high-value flats. And one can see that, though obviously service charges would resolve much of that. Are there other adverse impacts that you can see as people who work in the sector that we as a committee should be aware of from such a cap? The only thing I would say is a lot of government bodies sell land leasehold. It's right. more about because they like to keep some level of control. But if I was a £10 cap on that, then that probably would get around that issue. We just need to be careful around that point because it is generally government bodies who sell land as leasehold. Right, okay. Um, yes, um, it, it is true that um, many of um, local government um, disposals are on a leasehold basis. Right. I mean, some people said freeholders will be driven out of the market now. Some of our constituents might be very grateful for that, given the behaviour of some of them to, to date. Uh, is that your view? Would that drive freeholders out of the market? 
I, I think um, certainly in, in terms of those sort of large institutional um, freeholders, um, I, I, I fail to see what the incentive would be for them to stay in the market. But I understand that uh, representatives of, of the freeholders are in the next session and um, that probably would be an appropriate question to ask them. I'm sure they will. Thank you. Yes, sir. Coming back to some of the evidence that we've received, we've, we've got uh, a lot of accusations that purchasers of, of uh, leaseholds were told um, at the time of uh, buying their leasehold they will be offered the freehold either at a future time, either within one or two years, um, at a, 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 a lower price. They then discover that the freehold has been sold on uh, without their knowledge, and they're not even able to, uh, to they weren't offered the opportunity uh, to buy at the, the freehold. So can I ask this, uh, we've got evidence from individuals, uh, starting with Mr Honeyman, uh, who are customers who bought leasehold properties from your company, um, and have been told now that their properties have been sold on to, uh, I'll get the name of the company correctly, uh, Adriatic Land 4, brackets GR1. Um, and there are several here of, of different developments where the freehold's been sold on uh, without the leaseholder's knowledge, and they're now not able to buy the freehold at all. Why is that? Can I explain how we operate as a business? Uh, and then that may sort of add some colour to... Uh, so what we, we as a business are not long-term holders of assets, so we sell on the freehold at a point in time uh, when we complete a development. And the way we do that... Sorry, so can I interrupt you then? Yeah. Why don't you, at that point, when you're selling the freehold, offer it to the leaseholder direct and say, you can now, you now have the opportunity to buy this freehold? Well, if I can just explain how we do it, because we've never done it that way. So what we've no, so always... I'm asking why you don't do that. Well, principally because uh, a house does not have the right of preemption um, uh, to acquire the freehold. So we've always relied upon that to put the, all of the ground rents in a, in a portfolio and sell on that portfolio to an institutional investor at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the development. So that's how we've always operated as a business, certainly in terms of the so North West. So your contract originally, you sell the leasehold, you sell off the, the freeholds to someone else, and then the freeholder comes and says, well, no, we're not prepared to sell the freehold to you, or you can buy the freehold, it's now gone up to £50,000 um, instead of uh, uh, what you said at the beginning, I think, during your evidence, of maybe three or four thousand pounds difference. Yeah, certainly. So yes, that's the position. Yep, yeah, certainly the purchaser's rights shouldn't change whether I'm the freeholder or an investor is the freeholder. I think what you're referring to, or certainly what we've experienced through a number of complaints, is where we've sold on the freehold interest, and you could have acquired the freehold from us at between three and five thousand mm pound -hmm. where we've sold on our interest to an investor they've charged a higher rate yes because the market has gone up at that point i think we've gone through a period where the market was there it's gone up and it's come back down again i've not heard of a situation sir where they've refused to sell the freehold i've only had experience of the ground rent the cost of the uh, freehold has increased and as I understand, and you may hear it a little later in the second session, that all of our purchasers can now acquire the freehold at the original price, because I think the market has, has now reduced. Does that, does that make sense? It makes, it I, makes, I certainly haven't heard of people being refused. So what's your, what's your company's uh, arrangement with this company, Adriatic Land? Is this, this, presumably, is this a, a normal company to use? We, we only sell to institutional blue chip investment companies and Adriatic, who I know as Long Harbour, uh, are an FCA regulated investor and an experienced property manager. Right, so, but, but obviously it's up to them then to determine what they do in terms of the freeholds for your previous customers. It is. Right, okay, fine. So, um, why is it then that your company has this policy 
of you're going to sell it off to a third party and not offer it to the individual leaseholders at the time when you're offering the sale? It's how we've always operated as a, as a business, and I'm sure that's not the answer you want, but once a year we will no, sell... No, what I'm asking is yeah. why, why do your customers not get the chance to exercise the opportunity to buy their freehold? Purely... You're, just selling the, you're selling the freehold from out under them? Yes, Without we... their knowledge? Yes, we are. Right, yeah, OK. I... Well, I mean, it, you know, I would regard that as being, uh, quite frankly, a scandal. Uh, as a, uh, not offering the opportunity for people to buy the property in which they live and they've invested a large amount of money to be told that suddenly it's going to be managed by a new freeholder without them having the opportunity. I think your company, uh, my personal view, should review what you do in terms of business practice. But of course that's up to you what you do. Um, can I, can Sir, I... could I just comment upon that? Because sure. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, I subscribe to it as a, as a scandal. You're offered a freehold at the point of sale and a leasehold, and the law says that you could, you've got the right to acquire the freehold after two okay. years of living in it. And you're, you're right, right. I do not, you're, you're quite right, you're 100% right that I do not, I, I sell that basket of. Uh, leaseholds or freeholds to an investor without asking the customer whether they would like to buy it again. Okay. Do you think the law should be changed to stop that? I, I think the whole area of first right of refusal is confusing and I would suggest through the reform process I would take it a step further. I'd have a cap on consent fees, I'd have a cap, cap on calculation of ground rents. I'd have a ca calculation on the value of the freehold, and I'd make the whole process more consumer friendly. Okay, well, I, well, I agree with you, but, but in terms of the right of first refusal, do you think the law should be changed in that respect? It's, it's confusing, so you've got well, no, no right... Well, I don't know, can yeah. we have a yes or no? Yes. You do agree, so fine, good, mm. right. Okay, um, can I take from Persimmon and then Taylor would be the, the, the view of how you sit in this, in this particular I think aspect. your point's a valid one. We noticed this back in 2014. That's why we took the view not to enter any further arrangements with these third parties. And we decided to induce a right to buy to the customers of a previously outlined, which is capped at 25 times or the market value, whichever is the lesser. What have you done for the people prior to 2014? The ones prior to 2014? Obviously, that situation we weren't aware of at that time, but we've got very little complaints before 2014. Okay, all right, fine, thank you. Um, as part of our evidence to um, the committee and in our, our response to the government's consultation um, on tackling the leasehold market last year, we did recommend um, that that inequity um, between um, the offering the, uh, the right of first refusal to um, leaseholders, uh, leasehold houses, um, should, should be changed, so we would be very supportive of that change. And we also recommended that um, the fairness, speed, um, and, and cost of the um, sort of the enfranchisement process should a, a freeholder not willingly um, uh, sell at a fair price um, be reviewed um, to, to benefit customers also. Okay. So I'm going to just come back to your one issue, that is the uh, relation that there could be conflicting connections between your, your company as a, as a housing developer and some of the investment companies that are buying these freeholds. It's been suggested to us that there may be senior executives and management of the development companies that may also be senior executives or, or directors of the uh, the people that are buying the freeholds. Is, is there are there any cross connections? That's definitely not the case at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not the case. I think where this matter originated from. So when you sell a subsidiary company. Yeah. Within that company, there are names of directors, and that company is then acquired. That's how uh, the freeholds are sold. So I think there was some confusion around there, but we're certainly not linked to any investors in any way, shape, or form. So we can be clear that none of your listed directors or senior managers are senior managers or directors or have any financial interest <coughs> in the so-called blue chip companies. Hundred percent, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. I can confirm likewise. Okay, thank you. Helen. Mm -hmm. Just follow up with Priscilla. I mean, you, you don't sell houses now, leasehold, or you're, you're also saying that you're offering where you have done, 
uh, the opportunity to buy the freehold. What about flats? You're still selling your flats um, uh, freeholds onto third parties, aren't you? Not, no, we haven't. We haven't sold any onto third parties, not since 2014, no. So you we're still selling leasehold, but we're not, we haven't sold any onto third parties in the past. So you're no. keeping the freehold of flat complexes you build, are you? Yes. So w what is the connection then? Uh, we mentioned uh, um, a a a a Adriatic land. I mean, Adriatic land number two was actually was originally persimmon group number three. So what's your connection with Adriatic was a deal which was done in 2013 for the disposal of the 470 properties which we made. Yeah. There's been no, dis no contact with Adriatic since 2013. Right, so you, you haven't sold any freeholds no, The last disposal was, was 2014 of 514 units. Right. Okay, right, thanks. Uh, yes, Kevin. Um, just back to the, um, you talk about saleability, that, that's the criteria, whether it makes, it, it makes a property unsaleable, Mr Jenkinson, but... Um, sorry, I'm, I was, sorry. You talk about saleability as being the criteria you'd apply, whether a lease, contra, a grand rent is fair, whether it makes the property saleability. But there's also an element of fairness here we, that we look at, aside from the saleability of a property, uh, on these issues. You said before that over the last 10 years, none of you have increased ground rent significantly over 10 years. That's what you said before in your earlier evidence. That was right, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, if you applied RPI to something 10 years ago that was, say, 300 pence, it would now be 403 pence. So that's increased by 33% on RPI. <coughs> Why is that? Why would you have... If you're saying they haven't increased over... How can RPI be fair? Well, I think I need to do some work to demonstrate what we were charging 10 years and 10 years before that, before I could answer that. And the, the only indice that seems to be acceptable to lenders and is RPI, and it's CML compliant. I mean, I can't offer you more no, than no, that. No, what would be acceptable to lenders, you'd probably agree, is nil increase. would be perfectly acceptable to lenders, wouldn't it? Well, yes, but it's um, the main so, lenders. It's uh, having a CML compliant lease that the main lenders support, and then that you have a marketable lease. I think that's. Uh, but a zero increase. I mean, there is a difference between leasehold houses and, and apartments in terms yeah. of the stewardship. I accept that. Mm. But on leasehold houses, there is no justification for a, le a ground rent to increase, is there? No justification, other than a profit opportunity for yourselves. Well, my limited understanding of it is if you have a long-term interest in the property that's got a 10-year rent review based on IPI, it's perfectly acceptable. To who? I can't... Uh, to the lenders, to well, the we purchasers... Are, we are talking about not just the lenders here, we're talking about yeah. the people who live in the houses and own them. And it's not acceptable to lots of them that effectively there's an increased cost for no purpose, as the Chair said in his first questions. There is no purpose to this. It's just an opportunity to create extra revenue from the properties you're selling. That's the fact, isn't it? Well, we ever we acquire the, the the value at the point of sale and sell it for two hundred thousand, or we sell on the freehold at a late a later date. I don't think uh, uh, I, you're suggesting it's bad practice, but it's certainly not the way we operate. Uh, we'll either collect all of the income at the point of sale or we'll sell a leasehold and sell it on at a later date. That's how we've done it in the past. In, can I just push it in terms of <clears throat> In terms of the people pre-2014, <coughs> Mr Jenkins, you were saying those people, you might have sold those ground rents on at a, a multiple, and that's, there's nothing you can do about that because you've just sold them on. Not, we haven't got the same level of control. Obviously, if I was in a heaven problem with any of them, obviously I would look at that. But as I'm aware, as I'm sorry, I haven't reviewed the ones we sold. We're not aware of any leases that would affect the marketability of the property. But if I was, I'm quite happy to look at them. Well, we speak to lots of people, for various different people living in the houses <coughs> you've built, who are very unhappy about this. Wouldn't it be the right thing to do just to make a commitment to buy those freeholds back, those ground rent, those freeholds back, and sell them back, or back to those people, even if it's pre-2014. You must have an ongoing relationship with the people you're working with in terms of Long Harbour or whoever else. You must be able to do that and do the right thing, even though it might cost you money. But those, if those leases have increased unfairly through an RPR charge, 
RPI, RPI charge that is for no purpose. It's going to cost people more and more to buy these leases back, even if they're even if they're available to them. But what you're saying is they're probably not available to them, and they can't get out of these leases because they're sold on to a third party, and they can't do anything about it. I could comment. I think there are, there are a few things there. F firstly, um, the purchasers of properties um, will have received information that clearly indicated that they were acquiring freehold or leasehold properties. They would have been advised by independents um, conveyancing well, solicitors. The, 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 terms, the, the, the terms of the, of the lease, um, certainly in respect of Taylor Wimpy's leases, were clear and, and simple. Um, they were aware that they were not buying a freehold um, property, that it was a leasehold property, and they will have been advised by their independent solicitor yes. of the terms of the rent review. And if that isn't the case, and I understand that there have been issues that have been raised, then um, the, the customers um, should, um, should be going back to their conveyancing solicitors. Um, we have um, uh, looked at all of the relevant information um, that was available at the time of, um, of, of these sales, and um, uh, customers have raised um, some concerns, and where they have done so, we've asked them to present us with any relevant information for review and consideration, and to date we haven't received any, any relevant information that suggests that they were unaware of the nature of the property or the tenure that they were acquiring. It's slightly different to our experience so far, but we'll come on to that point. Mary. Thank you. Uh, actually, it leads very nicely on to, to the question I was going to ask, yeah. because um, contrary to, to that evidence, previous evidence which we've received suggested that people actually didn't know about the terms of the lease and didn't know that there were on, um, owner's ground rents um, potentially involved in them. And in fact, what was described to us was a rather cosy relationship between developers um, and solicitors, conveyances, mor mortgage brokers, um, which could actually Actually be termed a commercial relationship with intimation that there were referral fees being paid in exchange for introductions etc. I'd be interested in your comments on that. Um, we did hear that some buyers were required or induced through offers of discounts, free carpets, a loan etc. to use conveyance insister, uh, solicitors recommended by their developers. They seem to think there was a list and that they should go to this list. Um, what do you, why do you think so many leaseholders therefore claim their solicitors failed to inform them of onerous, potentially onerous terms to their leases? Um, a solicitor um, is required to act independently on behalf of their client. Um, uh, they, uh, whether um, they were identified as part of a panel solicitor, and, and we do, um, actually Wimby does, as do many of our um, competitors, um, to assist customers identify solicitors who are uh, familiar with the development, um, operate locally, and familiar with uh, new, uh, new home sales. Um, it is entirely a matter for the customer to decide who they uh, wish to use. Um, and um, even if they're on the panel um, uh, that we recommend, the first duty of that solicitor is to their client. And it is the solicitor's responsibility to ensure that um, the customer is fully aware of both the ownership structure of the property and the terms of any, um, of any lease. May I just add to that? We, we provide a local list of solicitors on each development and often get asked by uh, purchasers for assistance, whether it's flooring contractors, solicitors, um, curtains and carpets, those types of things. And we, we have a list of solicitors that are local to that development and we would put on that list where we've previously had experience that they're providing a good service to our customers. It, there are no commercial relationships between Bellway and any solicitor. We've never received any referral fees. And that list will change from region to region across the country. And it's the purpose, if I could just explain the purpose, is some conveyancing solicitors are set up to work with new builds, to run volume through their business because they have a lot of conveyances. So those types of solicitors are used to working on developers such as ours or Taylor Wimpy, whereas some uh, conveyances are a more boutique or there's just one or two partners in that practice and would be slower and uh, less helpful. So we, we always find the repetition and the volume guys 
provide a better price to the purchaser and are more used to that type of land. Could you see or envisage a situation where a solicitor may not be in as inclined to give the full uh, gamut of information about the um, leasehold and its, and its potential um, pitfalls uh, because they rely on the business that they're getting from the developer? I, I, would, I would suggest the opposite because if you're a North West solicitor, you're used to uh, selling leaseholds in that in that fashion, and you should be more adept at selling, uh, explaining that to your customers. We we train and instruct all of our sales advisors to notify purchasers at the point of reservation what type of tenure they're buying is set out clearly on the contract documentation. And further, we insist that they seek independent legal advice. So I don't always subscribe to the idea that people were unaware of what they were buying. I think the whole doubling ground rents is a different issue, but I don't think they're unaware of buying. And I certainly haven't got uh, complaints in that regard. So it is really, I mean, it is that the solicitors may not have been telling them um, the details of the ground rents. Could this be a potential problem? I don't it's clearly from the evidence that we received. This well, is something it's strange that we were raising. The evidence you receive compared to our experience, you have to remember there's five clear points of contact when this will have been made out. At the reservation stage, it's made clearly out. They sign a reservation form or we're trained to tell them. When they meet the brokers, this has got to be factored into their financial viability before they even apply for a mortgage. They had to know it was a lease. The solicitor. There's no way they wouldn't tell them that it wasn't a leasehold property and explain the ground rent. When they apply for the mortgage, it has to be filled in the mortgage application form. Then finally, the valuer takes account of it and I've read the CML rules. I'm not sure what more we can do. It's, I just can't reconcile the information, what you're being told by how they wouldn't know. What they may not have fully understand the implications of it, but they must have known it was leasehold. Um, is it the responsibility of the solicitor to point out the implications of a doubling ground rent or...? The, it would be, yes. Yes, and the broker, because you'd have to factor the affordability for and the mortgage and the value, well, when it comes to value it. All that was that taken into that. account. The code from the Law Society is extremely clear on what they have to do. They have to act independently and look into after their interests in all aspects of the transaction. If they've not done that, they've got a clear case to go to the Law Society. And I know you're going to be speaking to them later. I really struggle with this one to understand how they wouldn't have known. Okay. There's one, uh, yeah, it's an interesting point. There's one thing knowing, it's a, another thing understanding the implications, isn't it? And as you said earlier, Mr Jenkinson, you said that um, you know, if something affected its sale, it's something sale, saleability, then that is a problem. But you must concede that a, double, a ground rent that starts at a quite a high level and then doubles very definitely affects the saleability of that property. If it was ground rents, which it comes back, which, but it wouldn't get, the, it'll have been value in accordance with the CML rules. I realise that. It wouldn't have gotten a mortgage, it wouldn't have gotten a value. And I don't know how that could have happened. If they are there, and there's examples which Persimmon have done, I'm more than happy to look at them, as I keep saying. But in terms of understanding, I just can't no. see how they wouldn't know it was the lease. I accept that. But you will agree that a ground rent that starts high, say £400 a year, and then doubles every 10 years, does render that property unsaleable. You accept that point? I wouldn't say it would render it unsaleable, it could affect material, affect affect its value so, in our house. So you agree, therefore, that the solicitor, who, you're right, does have an obligation to look after that client. And if he but hasn't, at, at that point be recourse time. through that to two clear actions. One, to refer to the Law Society, or to do the no, no, normal litigation route. You think you agree then that that solicitor? Uh, I think he's got to explain to them what the cost is and what. what oh, sorry. Is. I think the solicitor would go through it, and you'd have to explain that. Yes. But but it's clearly he hasn't explained it in a way that somebody's understood that's going to materially affect the value. Therefore, that solicitor is potentially liable in that position. Therefore, for not doing their job right. Potentially explaining. Potentially, potentially. depending upon individual cases. Obviously, I can't pass comment. But the potential would obviously be there if he hadn't informed them properly and acted in their interests. Well, I think there are quite a few cases we may well refer on to you because the descriptions to us, people are you know, pretty sensible people um, coming in to buy a house. Um, the sales assistant obviously has got a customer there, they want to advance it. Oh, that's the solicitor you go to. Not a list, but that's the one. Pick up the phone, actually talk to the solicitor uh, and make the arrangements 
for them now because there is a solicitor who knows the area, knows the scheme, knows you as a developer, exactly the point you made, Mr Honeyman, that they'll get it on, they'll do it quickly. That's the description we've had in a lot of cases. No, been, something was going wrong, wasn't it? Not at all. The real reason, no, no. So the real reason why, can I just explain? Yeah. The real reason Persimmon used yeah. Panasist is, is to save the customer money because they only need to review the title once. Right. If you go each individual time, the biggest part right. of actual cost for a sale is to review the title. Okay. So, you, so you say that's what it's to go to because they'll do it cheaper for you? No, they'll ah, save them so the cost of doing the title. Right, okay. I mean, I think there's a, something you need to look at there, and it may well be we, we picked up with the Law Society as well. But Helen. Um, we have heard evidence of a range of very problematic practices around leaseholds, whether it's doubling ground rents, whether it's selling on um, leaseholds, um, freeholds solely for the purposes of investment. Um, we wouldn't be sitting here doing an inquiry if there wasn't that evidence. You wouldn't be sitting in front of us as witnesses um, if that wasn't the case. And, and each of you today have given us um, examples of ways in which you're proactively changing your practices under the pressure of public opinion in response to those problems. Um, the, those problems taken together have been compared um, in some of the evidence that we've received to the mis-selling of PPI. Um, would you agree with that analogy, and do you think there should be a similar compensation scheme um, for affected leaseholders? Um, no, um, I wouldn't agree with that characterisation. Um, th this is um, a transaction, a legal transaction. As, as David explained, there are a significant number of touch points and uh, professional advice being sought and rendered um, on behalf of, of the customer. Um, as I have indicated before, we accept that um, the uh, specific uh, lease um, of concern to Taylor Wimpy uh, did not meet um, our high standards of, of customer care, and we are working hard to resolve that on behalf of our customers. But um, we are satisfied that the information that was available to our customers and the nature of the legal advice um, that was offered to them was independent, and the, uh, the solicitors, the legal advisors, um, have a duty of care to their client, um, not to uh, not to the developer um, or the vendor. I, I don't believe we've missold all our leases um, uh, are perfectly marketable, and I, I haven't got the problem that that Jenny's got. So we don't. I don't believe there's a compensation issue or a misselling uh, position there. I don't have any claims on my desk as we speak about the issue, and I, I think. Taylor Wimpy, uh, credit to them, they've had a problem, they've put their hand up, they've put in a provision and they're trying to fix it. My position is the same as Jason, every customer, we've had about 15 customers right to us working hard, I couldn't get a mortgage for the house, whenever we've offered assistance, we've been able to get them, get them a mortgage and the property's been sold on. We don't believe we have an issue the same way as, as Bellevue. Lots of your customers who've uh, run across all three companies who've been in touch with us, um, would beg to differ on that. So I, I mean, I think that there, there is a job to do in terms of follow, following up with that with that evidence, because the evidence you're giving us today simply doesn't reflect what many of your customers are telling us as a committee. Okay. Um, yes. Um, do you support the government's proposal to restrict the sale of new build leasehold houses? Um, yes. The and the government proposals are, are, appear sensible. Um, I think it, um, we do welcome the, um, the inclusion of an exception for um, shared ownership houses because I think it's important given um, the wider housing debate that there, there is access um, and uh, a leasehold is required um, for, for, for shared ownership. Um, I think the, the other exception needs to be that you know, the definition of a house is, um, is something that's not clear, but there are instances where, um, because of this sort of structural nature of a, of a property, it would be um, impossible to sell it on a freehold basis. But, but otherwise, yes, we, would, we welcome um, okay. the government's uh, proposals around um, uh, banning uh, sale Any of Any different houses. views? Thank you, sorry. Any different views to that? Or? No, we, we certainly stopped selling leaseholds in the summer of 17. We went as far as to go back and we had three <coughs> developments where we only owned the leasehold. We had to go back to the local authorities to acquire the freehold so that we could forward sell it back to the purchasers. I've got one development left, sir, in the east of London, Barking Riverside that I still can only sell on a leasehold basis because I acquire the land from the Greater London Authority on a leasehold basis. And sometimes some of these urban developments do, uh, Jenny alluded to it, do get a little bit complicated because we have 
houses that sit on top of podium decks with parking underneath. So sometimes the best form of tenure is a leasehold in that instance. Any, oh, oh, the and what they, about the north end of the time, yeah. Sorry. The North West, is there any reason other than custom and practice that the North West had a lot of leasehold homes? I'm, I'm unaware of the, the reason, albeit it goes back very many decades. I spoke to a managing director who runs a business for me, who has worked for me for 18 years. He's lived in Liverpool all of his adult life and he owns a leasehold house and I asked him the same question yeah. and he said Jason I don't know we've always done it that yeah. way sure. and I own the leasehold house myself and I'm quite happy with it it's just endemic in that in that area. Can I just touch on something called leasehold um, which is it seems to be there's an increasing occurrence of local authorities granting consent for freehold properties on estates where they're not probably willing to adopt the road, there might be a, uh, there might be some uh, um, water management issues on that site, for example, uh, such schemes, for example, where effectively you're getting manage, uh, private management companies that are not subject to any particular rules that seem to be able to charge residents of those estates whatever they want. And in fact, I've got a constituent like that myself. Uh, property has been sold by London Homes that came to see me only recently. Any thoughts on what, what on earth is happening and what can be done about that? No, but certainly uh, I, I understand the problem. Local authorities are less willing to adopt public areas, roads, sewers, street lamps. Why is that? Because uh, they don't want the obligation and the cost that goes with it. Okay. So often they're left with the developers who then create a residence management company to manage that issue. So, okay. so they're granting plan permission on the cheap, if you like, taking some of the new homes bonus maybe and the council tax, but not necessarily the obligations of looking after those properties. Is, would that be a fair description? I, I just think some of the developments are becoming more complicated. They may not have the skill set. They don't want the responsibility of managing it, and it's easier to push it back to the residents okay. or the developer. Mr Jenkins. I would agree with Jason's comments, what we've tried to do, because the problem is the in, le leasehold flats are protected that way, and to your own amount of the management charges, which was Helen Goodman's speech the other day, I think yeah. what you're referring to. What we've tried to do is put a, a contract in place, because houses haven't got quite the same protection, so we've run right. into the transfer the right way. There has to be a certificate to, to make sure all any expenditure, any expenditure can be justified. Yes. I think you're on a fair point. So you need some more regulation in this, this area, basically? I wouldn't disagree at all. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the committee this afternoon. I think we will be following up with you on one or two of the examples we've had, which maybe uh, doesn't quite relate in the experience of the customers to the things you've told us this afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to give evidence to the committee. Could I just ask you to go down the table and say who you are and the organisation you're representing today, please? My name is Nigel Glenn. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association of Residential Managing Agents. Uh, John Dyer, I'm uh, Chair of the BPF's Residential Management Committee. My name is Mick Platt, I'm the CEO of the Wallace Partnership Group. Uh, we invest in uh, residential leasehold titles. We have approximately 106,000 um, under management. I'm Richard Silver, I'm an Executive Director of Long Harbour, an FCA regulated um, residential investment firm. Okay. Done. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, with respect to the various roundtable events and evidence sessions that we've had, uh, we've had the roundtable event last month with leaseholders, and uh, you know I can confirm that the loudest applause we actually had uh, was when participants called for an abolition of leasehold. Uh, we've had the all-party parliamentary group on leasehold, and they have put in re uh, written evidence uh, to the effect that. Uh, and I quote, leasehold is a form of residential tenure that has been abolished in most places around the world and should end in this country. Uh, and uh, thirdly, we've got the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership and they are arguing that um, almost nowhere else in the world continues with this archaic and deeply flawed leasehold system, which means that flats are sold as tenancies and leaseholder uh, owners are therefore disadvantaged. So. Uh, you know, uh, given that background, um, uh, common hold is an alternative uh, model which leaseholders can own and manage the properties. 
What additional value are freeholders actually providing within the process? Okay, if I can uh, uh, go first on that. Um, first of all, I should say uh, that uh, we, we support the government's proposal to ban leasehold houses. Um, if you look at apartment blocks, um, there are slightly different um, structure to apartment blocks. There are lots of different vested interests. You could have uh, owner-occupiers, you can have um, uh, buy-to-let investors, you can have commercial uh, units, you can have housing associations. And what the freeholder provides uh, for an apartment block is independent stewardship and government governance. Um, the freeholder is the only investor in that building who is there for the long term, uh, there to preserve the long term value of the building. Most occupants of a block of flats will, um, a, a flat will change hands between roughly every five to seven um, years. So we preserve the long term value of the building. We uphold the covenants in the lease. Um, which means that we are independent. Uh, we are independent arbiters uh, between the varying different interests in, um, in that particular building. Um, and we ensure managing agents work in the interests of leaseholders. We are the ultimate safety net for leaseholders um, when things go wrong. Um, now, obviously, there are varying various different types of ownership. You, uh, you've mentioned common hold, um, but we, uh, and obviously, people have that, that provides an element of choice um, for, for consumers. Uh, but we believe the presence of a, a long-term freeholder um, is of benefit um, to people who live in apartment blocks. Mr Silver? Um, I'd, agree, I'd agree with um, Mick's comments entirely. Um, and I think for the provision of those services and that um, long-term oversight and um, stewardship, um, a, a reasonable ground rent um, is, is important. Um, for the record, we absolutely agree with the government's direction of travel and banning um, leasehold houses going forward. Okay. We completely agree with the um, elimination of onerous ground rents and um, we also agree that improvement and regulation in the managing agent regime within blocks of apartments is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, in that context, we have produced, and this committee has received it I think at the end of last week, an industry-led code of practice, um, which actually um, enshrines a lot of these disciplines and principles and was pulled together by um, a, a large cohort of institutional investors. Okay, Mr. Clare? Um, as a managing agent, in a sense, we don't mind who manages the building because we're appointed to manage on their behalf, whether it be a freeholder, uh, an RMC, or a common hold. And in one sense, at the moment, we do have something philosophically similar to common hold when we have RMCs where you have leaseholders who come together and franchise buy their own block and manage it so we can we can learn from that there are advantages and disadvantages to each if I if I take the RMC one first you have the obvious advantage that people the people that as a managing agent you're dealing with are interested in the in the development personally so um, they have perhaps a little more short-term view than, than maybe others because they're only there for five to seven years, but you're dealing with the people who um, actually live there. So that's an advantage because if you're dealing with a freeholder, you also then have to deal with leaseholders uh, as well. A disadvantage of that is don't underestimate how much effort there is in actually managing a building. So I've been on an RMC board. It's not funny the amount of work that that involves. I mean, my particular where I live is an RMC. They meet every month five to six hours uh, for a board meeting alone. Emails are flying to and fro every single day. So there's a lot of work involved there. My concern on that is you will then have people who have, shall we say, not potentially the right set of skills or knowledge of property law in particular. So there are many examples of where people who have RMCs when, when I had a company instructing me to do things which frankly were against the law but they didn't know um, any better because they weren't familiar with the law. Advantages of working with Commonhold um, are, are those, that the idea of having a similar document instead of a lease but a contract is very, very attractive for managing agents because, as you may be aware, every building has a different lease, so you have to be familiar with the individual aspects of each lease. That, that's something which is, which is not good. The advantages of working with a professional landlord, if they have a portfolio, it's a single point of contact. So if, again, speaking selfishly as a managing agent, that just makes it operationally more efficient. They are uh, up to speed with legislation, so that is a, a big advantage. They have the time to invest in the property, whereas an amateur board, as I say, might can only meet once a month, and that for them is very, very onerous. Um, 
you will have access to somebody. Again, a board who is an amateur board tends to have difficulty in recruiting people. We saw that in Australia where they have strata, which is effectively common hold, and they found, uh, I think it was 37% of the board said so they had difficulty in recruiting. So there are balances one way and the other in each one. Okay, Mr. Dyer? Uh, similar to that, there is, the original question was what's the advantage of freeholders? It is a long term, a lot of freeholders are there for long term. Um, as I work for firm management agents, the big advantage of a freeholder is quite often you have, a, in the smaller blocks, you have, um, if someone doesn't pay their service charges for whatever reason, there's a shortfall, you can't pay for services, you can't pay energy bills, you can't pay contractors. A lot of free orders quite regularly lend money to the service charge, there's no interest charge on that, it's just a, a fund to make sure that that service charges and, and services can be provided. Um, it's very much, as, as you said, you have an RMC um, structure now which is quite similar. Um, it, I think people all around this table will support Common Hold in some form, it's been around for a while but mm -hmm. the proposal are to sort of refresh it. Um, there's not only difficulties in finding people willing to take part. I mean, recently with increased legislation on health and safety and liability, I mean, the Hackett report has got uh, the freeholders, the duty, you have a, to want a duty holder. Now, very few um, people who run this, they live there and run it in their spare time. Uh, in literally the last few months, we've had, as, as personal experience, had RMCs folding because no one's prepared to do it, so it reverts back to the freeholder. Now, without that sort of freeholder comfort blanket, who would do that? If there's a shortfall in the service charges because someone's not paying, who do you get the loan from? So there is advantages and there's examples of what freeholders can do positively. I'm sure there is you know, negative examples as well, but there, there is a, a, a big advantage to having a good freeholder that can step in and, and do these roles that more frequently uh, residents, whether it be of common hold company or, a, or RMC, are, are not prepared to do anymore. I mean, you've pointed out some of the positive aspects uh, in terms of the role that uh, freeholders and their managing agents um, actually undertake, but we've had evidence sessions and roundtables where um, leaseholders are saying, well, we can't even get hold of uh, our freeholder or managing agent, and sometimes the remedial works uh, forget actually getting under, uh, undertaken. They're just, it's just weeks and months on end until somebody actually replies to us. So we've had very, very negative feedback um, uh, to, to that effect. But I mean, l let's move on to common hold. In your uh, expert opinion of the market, common hold, which was first introduced in 2002, why do you think that hasn't actually taken off? Mr. Lane? Um, it was before my time as CEO, which is, which is no real excuse, but it's not an area I'm familiar with. I would ask what sort of incentives were given to developers to sell to common hold, because you know, as we saw from the first group, if you're selling something, there's another asset stream available. Why would you forego the second stream for the sake of the first one if there's no advantage? So I don't know what the government gave to developers. And the second one, my, my background was in a, uh, originally in investment banking, would be whether banking, uh, the, the banking community was up to speed with it so that there were mortgages available to purchase on. Yeah, no, you, you're very right there because I think the House of uh, House Fe uh, Builders Federation actually said that in terms of common hold uh, properties that there was a uh, unsatisfactory in terms of the lenders were unwilling to lend. Um, but Mr. Dyer, what, what do you think? Um, it's a good thing. It was a, it was a, a new system. Okay, it's operating around the world, but it was a new system to the UK. Um, both developers and lenders weren't used to it, and they went with the status quo, they went with the leasehold structure because it was an either or opportunity and, that, and that, I think that's why it just never took off. Um, any new common hold, I mean I think that all parties now are probably much more supportive and it's to make it the, the route of choice rather than an option if that's the way that it's seen. Uh, Mr Platt, would, would you be supportive of common hold and why do you think it's not taken off? Um, I, I don't think there's any sort of um perfect tenure of ownership. I mean, Common Hold presents it, it, it's, it has its own advantages and it, um, it, it presents its own set of challenges. Um, and the leasehold system does that as well. But the leasehold system you know, works very well for, for, for the large majority of, of leaseholders. Um, and I would concur uh, with the other speakers that um, um, going with the status quo, uh, which is practice that uh, many people understand, is, is possibly more preferable than, um, than going with something which isn't widely understood or, or, or is, is, is new. For so it's more a fear of the unknown yeah, in, in that sense? Um, I think it could be, but I, but, but I think the important thing is that consumers <coughs> have choice and it does present a choice. So. 
And Mr. Silver, what are your opinions in terms of why Common Hold hasn't taken off? Um, I tend to agree with many of the comments that have gone before. Um, and I think, as a general point, I think Common Hold can work. Mm. What, what, what I think where it is most effective is where there are small, mainly owner occupied laid developments. Um, so, in our portfolio, we, have, um, we directly manage 83,000 uh, uh, leaseholds. Um, so over 40% of our leaseholds are owned by investors. They don't live in the blocks. They're not owner-occupiers. And frankly, they, they're quite comfortable with um, an independent freeholder looking after their investment and making sure that the, 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 the block runs harmoniously. However, in, in many of the smaller blocks where you have willing participants who are happy to, to take over the stewardship role and make sure that everyone is working together in that block going forward, I think Common Hole can work. Um, on the previous panel, we heard about the fact that we are living differently. Blocks of flats these days are very different to how they were 20 or 30 years ago. They're often several hundred units, complicated mechanical engineering infrastructure, combined heat and power plants, um, mixed tenure, commercial units, etc. And I think in that instance, it's just too complicated to expect people in their spare time to run their own affairs. And that's why I think giving the consumer choice by invigorating common hold, which actually uh, since it was enacted in 2002, there have been many moves to, to make resident-led management structures more amenable through the, uh, um, and we applaud the work the Law Commission is doing at the moment in the right to manage space, for example, which is kind of a bridge between the leasehold, freehold structure and the common hold. So broader choice is good, but I don't think common hold is the solution to all of the issues that the industry faces. Okay, yeah, um, just on that point, um, and you point out some examples of complications around managing a, 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 a mixed block, a mixed use block, for example. But doesn't isn't that the way it works in other countries? The US has common hold. Lots of other countries around the world seem to manage with common hold. So why can't we do it? Um, Any so, ideas? Yeah, so, so you're correct. Lots of other jurisdictions do have a um, a form of common hold, and all of those jurisdictions, without exception, have problems with those tenures. Um, we're not suggesting for one moment, obviously, here today that there's no problem with leasehold freehold tenure, but what we, what we are suggesting is we do, as, a, as an institutional-backed freeholder, provide an extra layer of it's a safety net to, to the longevity and the well-being of a block of flats. What about the you today? Yes, please. Yeah. Say, why don't we do it? I think we can do it. Um, it's not there at the moment, but certainly as you know, managing agents, and uh, we, we could do it. I mean, it's not. I think the point is you could have other options, and the issue that is accepted around the other countries and Australia is referred to is there is this issue about people in the common hold structure, whether it, or the equivalent of the RMC structure here, that just aren't prepared to put their names forward, or they haven't got the time to do it. So that that isn't an issue that that I don't think there is a solution to. So maybe there's some way of making it easier so that people can get more involved. And it's the obligations and it's the, the legal obligations that go with that. Being a director of RMC does have legal obligations and it's just people, sure. a lot of people aren't prepared to take that legal responsibility of being a director of a company. What about the mortgage lender's perspective on this? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the mortgage I'm lender's perspective, to... anybody got a, any kind of insight into what mortgage lenders might think of of properties that are bought through so, with so a 10 years common hold. We looked at the, um, the UK finance, the, what was the CML um, register of the top 20 lenders and their policies on lending against leasehold properties. Um, the top 20 lenders um, represent over 90% of all mortgages in the, in the UK. Um, and about half of the lists don't, will not lend against a common hold tenure. Um, I hope we heard on the previous session two weeks ago here that part of that reason probably is the fact that there is limit, that there aren't many many common hold developments out there. Therefore, the product hasn't been developed by the lending community, and that's a perfectly valid perspective. However, um, the all of the lenders will lend against the leasehold structure, and it has worked very well. One of the things I wanted to sort of point out on this is. We hear um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the media and in, 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 in some of the engagements that we, we participate in about um, a, a number of 100,000 people trapped in unsellable, unmortgageable homes. Um, it's very interesting. We've done a lot of analysis on our specific portfolio. As I mentioned, we've, got a, a, we've directly managed 83,000 leaseholds. And we compared this year and last year um, with the amount of property transfers that we're required to do 
or the amount of notices of mortgage that, that we're required to do, and the volumes are the same. Um, we've had 157 uh, people write in to us to say, please can you vary the terms of my lease because I'm struggling to sell my house or, or, or remortgage it. And the significant vast majority of those are where there's a 10 yearly doubling provision in the lease, which we talked heard about in the last panel, and through the redress schemes that we're doing and others are doing, the leases are getting converted, the, houses, the flats are selling, or they're getting remortgaged. So as an industry, I think we've coalesced very well together to say, OK, there is a wrong here, we, we all regret it, actually, let's fix it and let's move on. So we're not seeing the evidence that you, you, you've gathered that, um, that people are stuck in their homes to the volumes that we're talking about. Dr. Uh, Glamigan, yes, just on, on, on Common Hold, what I wanted to say that is if we do go down that route, I think we have to go into it with our eyes wide open because it would be unfair for a new system if we don't take um, lessons from what we can see currently. So, for example, you know, I know it would be nice if, if we go to self-determination that everybody lives together in harmony. That is just not the case. I mean, you, you're pushing people together unnaturally and they're not related, they're not, it's not a family, into a large block. So we have to accept that there will be disputes. We see that in RMCs at the moment. The fact that disputes don't occur is, is not the case. They do occur. And if anything, they are, they are unfortunately worse than when you have a, a faceless landlord because if I handed you over to you know, a debt collection agency and I meet you in the foyer tomorrow, it's personal between you and I all of a sudden rather than, rather than somebody else. Um, so we do need to protect common holders, if you, if you like, from their own boards as well, so that there is an education there. And, it, uh, and I can come back to what I said earlier about where you have directors. We do need to put in, in place a structure where we can teach those people what it means to be a director of a UK company with the liabilities that that encounters, and what it means to be a director of a common hold company, or frankly at the moment, an RMC company with a, with a relevant le uh, legislation behind that. Thank you, Mary. In the previous panel, we discussed um, what it actually the phrase um, own, "onerous ground rent" means. Um, it would be quite interested in exploring what you consider to be onerous ground rent terms, and how many of your leaseholders are affected by such terms. Well, um, <clears throat> as discussed in the previous panel, we, we acknowledge that um, ten-year doublers are um, probably fifteen-year doublers. Um, are wrong and they should be eliminated from the market. Um, uh, in our portfolio, personally, we have fewer than 400 such leases and we are working with, um, with the affected leaseholders uh, to offer them suitable alternatives. Um, in, our, in our portfolio, we have 4,165 what we define as onerous leases, and onerous leases are leases that reviews more frequently, uh, doubles more frequently than uh, 20 years, so 15 years, 10 years, and so forth. Um, we have uh, 1,807 Taylor Wimpy 10 yearly doubling leases, and as at the 31st of um, October, we had 911 of those leaseholders who had either converted to an RPI link lease or were in the process of doing so, so it engaged with us. So how the, how the Taylor Wimpy scheme works, for example, is because we, we as freeholder, and, and there are others that have these leases as well, we're the point of contact with their customer. They've moved on, they've sold the site out. So we, we actually engage with the leaseholders uh, on a reasonably frequent basis, um, pertinent to their lease terms. So we, we, we've agreed a process where we've written to a number of the Taylor Wimpy um, customers, and there's other redress schemes we're party to as well, another redress scheme, and said, here's, here's, the, you know, here's, here's, the, here's the option for you to convert your lease. Um, this is how the process works, and there's a contribution that they can go off and procure their own legal services. So it's at zero cost to the leaseholder, which is quite right, and how it should be. Um, we've been doing this for about a year, and we've written to a number of the leaseholders on more, you know, three or four times. But you, you can't force someone to engage with you, but as, as um, Jenny Daly said in the previous panel, it's an open-ended offer. So at some point in the future, when somebody wants to remortgage or sell their house and they find they can't because of the terms of their lease, then they can come to us and we can, we can fix the matter. Um, going to the point about onerous leases and what therefore is an onerous lease. Um, it was an interesting comment that you made to um, the house building community uh, in the previous session about how much was ground rent 10 years ago and how much was it 20 years ago relative to today. Um, so we've done some analysis on that, which I'm very happy to share with the committee. And um, ground rents, starting ground rent in 2018 as a proportion of average wages or average house prices is lower than it was at every point in 1953, 1963, 1973, 1970, 1970. So in real terms, ground rents have not gone up. 
as a starting ground rent. And we have the evidence, and I'm very happy to share, share that with this committee. Yeah. Um, so the concept of a payment, of a £200 a year payment, um, which is the average ground rent in our portfolio, um, was the equivalent of £8.70 in 1953, where average house prices at the time were you know, £1,891 in the UK. Why did we pick 1953? That's the date when the Nationwide started its house price index. So that's as far back as we've got reliable information. <coughs> so our view, and it's enshrined in the code of practice that we, we, I previously mentioned, is that a, um, a, 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 an unfair lease or an onerous lease is a lease that is um, um, the, the, a, a fair lease is a lease that is basically. 0.1% of the starting value of the property at, when, at the point when it's sold, um, with a minimum of £200, and that uh, reviews over the, over the long term to an inflation factor, and we do use RPI. Um, so so that's, that's what we've tried to do, is say that is an acceptable lease, because actually it is, in, in, in terms of wage, wage comparison and house price comparison, it's lower than it's been. So are all of your leases um, therefore compliant with that 0.1%? Uh, the significant vast majority of them are. I, I'd need to check precise figures. I'd rather um, come back to you on that point. Okay. What would you consider to be on us? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, as a managing agent, we don't get involved in that. I mean, the managing agent's involvement might be to collect some ground rent on behalf of the landlord, but as such, we're, we're independent between uh, between the landlord and the lessee. I've got, I've got some thoughts on the proposed cap, if, if you would like me to look at that. I think, um, I think the £10 is a very, very strange number, to be quite honest. I, I'd, I'd be surprised if actually it costs less than £10 to raise that, if you think of the cost of administration, frankly, stamps and so forth. Um, so I don't really see why you're putting in a cap of £10. If, if the, the premise is to get rid of the professional landlord, then make it a peppercorn. Why, why give them £10 and sort of say, well, take that and take it or leave it? I think there's a danger there that what you could have is that the professional landlord will say, well, £10 is not worth it, and you get the not-so-professional landlord who will extract funds from a leaseholder in a different way would therefore be left uh, to go into it. So I, I don't see that. The other thing about the ground rent is, again, if we go on to our current structure, we have RMCs who have a ground rent. Again, if I may take a personal example, when we enfranchised, we used to pay £100 ground rent as an incentive for people to take part in enfranchisement. We set it to £10. That was the biggest mistake we made as a company because the RMC cannot function on the £10 that it gets from each um, leaseholder. We have costs, so we have you know, filing costs that, that, that are tiny, uh, but there's administration costs for AGMs, there's DNO costs, and something which nobody likes to talk about, the extensive litigation costs. When leaseholders disagree with their own RMC, the RMC has to somehow fund those. And how they've done it so far, they've had to sell their assets. They had a studio and they had to sell that, but you know, that pot will disappear. And we can't go back as much as we'd like to. Could it just, just would you mind if I just go to Mr. No, no, no. Um, I'm in similar. I'm right, for, for work for a manager, agent, so the, we're not the free. We're not freely collecting the, the ground rents. We collect them on behalf. The I totally agree with. If you're going to set a ground rent, there's no point in having it at ten pound because it's the cost of collecting that is more than the, the ten pound. You might as well go to a peppercorn. Um, and again, it's exactly the same. That the which is. The question back to the first one is what is the purpose of ground rents? I mean, on certain freeholders there is a purpose and certain RMCs there is a purpose because that does go, the money does go back into the stewardship of the building or the estate or whatever it may be. Um, I think if you're going to, you either limit it or, or you, you don't. I don't see the point in having a £10 cap. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Yeah, the, the point I was going to make was that, um, and it comes back to what I, I said right at the start, um, when you invest in um, ground rents as a freeholder, you undertake the obligations that are written in the lease. We're there to pre preserve the long-term value of the building, but more importantly, to, to enforce the covenants and act as a safety net for residents. Um, that is what uh, people get for ground rent. Now, if that ground rent is capped or disappears, um, then, um, then it would be very easy to purchase a freehold, um, and, and anybody could do it, and they might not necessarily um, have the, uh, the resources, the access to advi professional advice or the access to funds to, to, to be able to fulfil 
um, the freeholder side of the bargain. Um, and I'm not saying that means that um, freeholds would be acquired by disreputable um, uh, individuals, but it, but it does make it more possible. Okay. So from Wallace's uh, point of view and from um, Long Harbour, how much uh, of your income in terms of your companies uh, ge is generated by um, residential ground rent every year? So uh, in Wallace, uh, the annual rent we receive um, is £11.2 million. All our ground rents are funded by pension funds based in the UK. So all the ground rent we receive um, is used to service uh, the, the, the debt we have with those pension funds. Um, we have 160,000 uh, in our wider portfolio ground rents with an average rent of £200 per unit. So our, our, um, the ground rents that we collect is £32 million a year. Um, all of the investments in the ground rent fund are from UK-based pension schemes and insurance companies and all of that ground rent is delivered to those pension schemes so they can then pay their pensioners in their retirement. What percentage of your, your business would that be, the 32 million, 11.2? Uh, the entire, is that the entirety of your, in terms of your business, your company's the entirety business, of yeah, revenue, income, yeah. Revenue, um, it is in our case probably about 55 to 60%. So to be clear, the £32 million pounds is not Long Harbour revenue, it's revenue for the pension scheme. Right. So uh, we, we, we run three funds, one is a residential ground rent fund, the second fund is a <coughs> private rented sector bill to rent fund, so we're one of the leading players in, in the emergence of um, building um, long-term accommodation for the private sector and we also have a strategic land fund to buy land to bring forward, we work with Homes England at the moment in Northamptonshire to bring forward sites for sale. Um, so the £32 million pounds that I mentioned um, which, we, which um, our sister company Home Grant collects as the freehold servicing company on behalf of the pension funds is not Long Harbour revenue. Oh right, okay. So Long Harbour revenue would be? Uh, about £4 million pounds a year. Right, okay. I'll, I'll come back to you on the precise That's number okay. for that. That's okay. So, just then looking at the, the proposal for the £10 per annum um, uh, cap on ground rents, you, you've objected to it, to Long Harbour have objected yeah. to it. Um, so, why, why have you got concerns? So, I think it would, it would result in. Um, if it, our starting position, as I mentioned, is that we think um, the leasehold system needs to be brought into the modern era. And we've proposed through the various consultations, whether that's through MHCLG or the Law Commission, um, uh, our ideas on those issues and how to do that, culminating in a code of practice that actually forces good, good best practice on the various things that we do into the industry. Um, we've also mentioned that I think there is space for a reinvigoration of common hold for what I would call appropriate size developments. Um, that all gives consumer choice. If you cap a ground rent at ten pounds going forward, then actually there is no economic incentive for us to invest in the various teams of professionals that work in our business that, that undertake the stewardship role. So I have an estates management team of, of very experienced people. Their job is effectively to police the managing agents, so not Nigel Glenn's sort of uh, membership, around all of our developments. And if they're not working properly on health and safety, fire risk assessments, audit, all of the stuff that a managing agent is supposed to do, we work with the residents to replace them. So we act as a, as a, as a long-term um, a, a policeman, frankly. Um, that, there's a significant investment for that. We can't charge. That's, that's what we get in return for levying a, a reasonable ground rent. Um, we have uh, expert um, landlord and tenant lawyers in the business to give advice to people when they've got a dispute or when they want to do something with their lease in terms of changing their properties, whatever it might be. Um, at a £10 ground rent, we're not going to invest in that. But it's, it's, it, as, a, as a consequence, because there's no economic return, and we're therefore the likes of ourselves and others, I'm sure, will withdraw from this sector, and it, it potentially will, will, will open up an opportunity for um, less professional um, individuals and or organisations to, to, to buy up these assets for whatever means, for whatever reason they want to do so. And I'll just, I'll just clarify that in, in one respect. If you've got 100 flats in a block, and the ground rent is £200 per flat, that's £20,000 a year of income. Um, and we would pay probably in a normal market somewhere around about £600,000 to buy the freehold on that block. That block's worth £10 million, by the way, so we're 5 6% of the overall value. If the, if the rent dropped to, to, 10, to £10 a flat, you'd be able to buy that block, the freehold on that block, for £10,000. 
So, yeah. Um, and as a consequence of that, somebody might do that just to have access to those 100 flats to see however else they can make money. OK, so it could be a, a, a money-earning scheme for somebody else uh, as opposed to something that well, would a less professional, A less professional organisation that hasn't got the resource to do all the things that... We take our obligations under the lease. The lease is a contract where we have to do things, and we take those very seriously. Um, we can only do that in return for a reasonable ground rent. And we've heard that you've been getting in touch with um, uh, some of your um, leaseholders about the terms and conditions, if you like. I wondered what other uh, remedial action had been taken, perhaps by um, uh, your business, Mr Platt, um, to contact any leaseholders or to um, try to um, introduce voluntary remedial schemes? Um, well, as I say, um, we, we have very few onerous leases in our, our portfolio. And in fact, um, all those onerous leases uh, came about because we, uh, we did a large um, corporate transaction probably about four or five months ago. Um, so we don't have any um, tenure doublers granted by Taylor Wimpy, for example. Um, what we do do is we get um, probably 50% of our, our queries into our office um, on a daily basis uh, are from people asking for one aspect or another of the lease to be explained. Um, and obviously, um, a lot of people are coming to us and saying, would it be possible to vary the terms of our lease uh, because um, we want to make it more attractive to lenders or we want to sell? And in all those cases, we are um, endeavouring to find solutions for those people um, on, a, on a voluntary basis. Um, it, it's not in our interest to have dissatisfied leaseholders. Um, we'd like to think that they can, they can turn to us for advice, which we, which we freely give, um, and we are trying to help them as much as we can. So just looking at that term, some freeholders are offering leaseholders, if we've heard, um, the opportunity to convert du uh, the doubling ground rent clauses to one that increases at the rate of RPI. Is it really a better deal for leaseholders to convert? Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Otherwise they wouldn't be doing it under the current level of RPI. I, mean, I can remember RPI a little bit higher than 3%. <laughs> um, so it depends on the level. Um, under the current legislation for which the law Ref law commission is, is doing some very good work on in terms of simplifying for enfranchisement, so extending your lease on a flat or buying the freehold on your on, on your house, um, the cost of a Taylor Wimpy ten yearly doubling lease we heard in the previous session of some extortionate amounts of money, um, a lease granted say nine or ten years ago with a two hundred ninety five pounds. Um, starting ground rent on a 250-year lease that doubles every 10 years for the first five years would cost about £35,000 to enfranchise, either extend or buy, depending on a flat or a house. Um, if, you, if you convert it to RPI today, that same lease would cost about £6,500. And that's the way that the current valuation mechanisms work under the various acts, and so um, it's an immediate benefit to the leaseholder in that context of, you know, £28,000, £29,000. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just talking about enfranchisement, um, I mean, as well as fair ground rents, it's what we're trying to also achieve is a fair price for people to buy the freehold. I think Long Harbour did note in its, um, its submission to us that there are significant inaccuracies in the Law Commission's analysis of the current approach to valuation and its proposal for reform the leasehold enfranchisement process. Could you expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, there was a direction of travel paper, um, my phrase, uh, that the Law Commission put out in July ahead of its formal consultation, which we're currently all working on. Um, and that was specifically in relation to its thoughts at the time on where it wanted to get to to make it um, to enfranchise. Uh, houses and they had three examples in there house one, house two, and house three. And then there were different lease terms around each particular house. Um, and it looked a bit odd to myself and to colleagues and, and other investors because we didn't really recognize in any meaningful way the terms of the, of, of, of the, the terms set out in those examples. Um, so um, 
we did some analysis on our own portfolio to say, well, actually, you know, how many of these leases do we have? So, to give you an example, the, one of them is the, the Taylor Wimpy. The House C is a Taylor Wimpy 10 yearly doubling lease granted with 241 and a half years left to, to run, and some examples about how they calculate the enfranchisement value. Um, but certainly the way that it, it, it read was that that was the market norm, and there's lots of them out there. And as we've heard in evidence previously, um, we've estimated the size of the onerous lease market, so 10 or 15 year doublers, uh, less than 15,000 units out of 4.2 million. So significantly less than 1% of all the leaseholds. So it was, we were trying to establish from the Law Commission more precisely, and I wrote to Professor Hopkins about this, um, you know, what the benefit of, of, of putting in a, what I would call a relatively extreme minor example of a house um, in, into that paper was going to do in the context of actually getting a really good informed debate about the wider market. You know, the majority of leases in the market aren't onerous. The majority of leases in the market are, or a significant number of them are, inflation linked. The problem isn't actually the calculation so much as the process that, that, of, of, of how you actually do the enfranchisement. The current laws, the, the way the current law is structured, um, the, the, the regulations, it, it immediately creates a conflict between the leaseholder and the freeholder, especially if, if one pursue, pursues the statutory route, because the leaseholder is incentivized to go and find a valuer to value the, the, their lease as cheaply as possible. A freeholder arguably is, is incentivized, could be incentivized, we don't actually follow this practice, could be incentivized to actually put a higher price in as possible. And then you spend a whole load of time with lawyers and, and getting evidence okay. that's very expensive. Okay, one of the <coughs> previous witnesses suggested a simple formula, a simple multiple. I mean, you, you mentioned before, Mr. Silver, that um, you, know, you, you gave the example of a block of, I think, 100 units, and you apply the 30 times multiple to the ground rent. So, 30 times, so if I, if I own a flat or a long lease on a flat in one of your blocks and pay 200 quid ground rent, a month. What, what would I expect to pay for the freehold? Um, it, it really depends on the person. Why does it depend? Because it, you bought it on a multiple as, as an investment. So why would it depend? So I'm investing pension fund capital. That pension fund effectively has, 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 has the opportunity to invest in ground rents or in other assets. And it is therefore a comparable rate of investment. Um, that's the first thing. But th th that is dependent upon long-term interest rates and long-term inflation rates. So they're the, they're the only two variables. So in a high inflationary environment um, where interest rates are, are high, then actually it's significantly cheaper to buy out your freehold. And that's the valuation system. <laughs> but we're trying to get to some fair position here. And I know there's two, uh, two sides. To this, if there's a, a kind of, on the scales here, there's, if, we, if we're, the government's trying to make it cheaper for long leaseholds to enfranchise, it's going to make it... It's disadvantaged freeholders, of course. There's only it's part of the same, two sides yeah. of the same coin, isn't it? Yeah. But you said before, 30 times you applied, that was roughly the value of these things when you look for investment. It's 200 quid, 30 times 200 quid is 6,000 quid. Why can't I just buy that freehold from you? Uh, that was just a simplified example. Yeah, but it's pretty much what we would expect. So we're advocating, and I mentioned that we proposed this to the Law Commission, and they've, 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 they've actually suggested it as an option. For long leases, so leases longer than 100 years, which is our main business, um, that there should be some form of online calculator that everyone has access to, that's free or for a nominal fee. You input your pertinent lease details, and that gives a very transparent valuation. Um, and the reason what, what one would want to do that is, typically, on the long lease market, where people want to look for a lease extension, um, the legal fees and the valuation fees can cost the leaseholder £2,000. The lease extension itself might only be £3,000. So if you can eradicate all of that extra cost by having a transparent, fair um, uh, point of reference to calculate these things, I think that's the way forward. And we've advocated that absolutely to the Law Commission. OK. There's going to be multiple at some point in terms of the times of the grammar. Mr Platt, could you answer that question? Well, What's a fair amount? I, I think um, it's important to remember a, a couple of things. Firstly. Um, uh, when we invest in ground rents, um, we are investing um, pension fund money. And the reason um, that money gets invested with us is because of the long-term nature of the lease. We are all in favour of making the enfranchisement process simpler and more transparent. And fairer um, and cheaper? 
and, and, and fairer. But I th think the point I would and make is you can't, you can't take things that are complex and make them simple. And the point is that um, freeholders don't have a choice about whether to grant an, uh, an, a lease extension or to enfranchise. It's something we're obliged to do by law. So all we ask in, in return for that is that we receive fair compensation such that the pension funds that have invested in the ground rents don't, don't lose out. All in favour of making it as transparent as possible and that's actually what we try to do with all our leaseholders who call our office and say, okay. can I buy my freehold? Okay, we've got, so took some evidence and somebody's got £100,000 flat with I think 67 years left to remain on that lease. Where they've been costing £14,000 to buy the freehold. It sounds really unfair. 14% of that value of that property, for example. Yet, there doesn't seem to be any logic to that level of, uh, uh, of the cost of that freehold compared to the cost of the ground rent, which is why, how your, you, when you purchase those freeholds on behalf of your investors, that's the calculation you made, a simple calculation in terms of the number, uh, a multiple of that, of the revenue. Can I come in, sorry, I think the point in the example you just made, is the difference between you said a 67 year lease. Now, there is value in a 67 year lease, so that person who bought it at 67 years wouldn't have paid the same purchase price as someone who bought a 200 year lease because it, it's, you know, it's a lot shorter. So I think that the. And we wouldn't have bought it on a, a simple multiple of the ground rent. Right? Because it's not valued on when people buy in those shorter. I know sort of it's thing. not valued like that, but why isn't it? Because you're buying them like that. You're buying them on a simple multi. No, we're not. No, no they're, they're not. That's the not 67 year not, leases. No, to no, no, but we're talking. You could be talking much longer leases. That was an example of how unfair it is. But the reality is, you're buying these leases. And I get your point about charging a fair ground rent because that gives you incentive for the economic model. I get all that. And some of these things are complex. I get all that. But you've got to be fair to the people who bought the ground rent, uh, who are living in those properties with a ground rent. And want to get out, and yet they're actually being screwed at a point in time. They want to buy that freehold. That just can't be right. And doesn't. Be f I mean, one of our witnesses, for example, one of the uh, members of parliament for the uh, Commonwealth Leasehold APPG, was saying it should be five times your grant rent. Let's make it so easy for them, cheap for them, which I'm sure you think is very unfair. But unless we get to something that is really simple yeah. and easy mm -hmm. and fair you're going to lose this argument in a way that's really going to hit the sector very, very badly. It's, it's, I think, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. it's a good point you make, but I think if we look at um, the way properties are bought and sold, we heard a lot in the previous session about new build. So, but actually, the second-hand market has also got some systemic issues in it. And we welcomed last year the MHCLG um, consultation on the, uh, sim simplifying the buying and selling process. And we look forward to what the government's going to bring forward in that context um, at some point. But here's the thing. Um, somebody decides that they want to go and buy a flat somewhere, and the first thing they'll do is they'll be uh, sitting on their sofa at home, looking on their iPhone at local estate agents and thinking, you oh, know, I can afford a flat in that particular area, because the headline price seems to be within their price bracket. And they will then look at the pictures, they'll look at the EPC, they'll look at the floor plan, um, they'll go and visit the flat, and, and, and they'll think, great, I'll take it. It's not till several weeks later that actually they've realised they can't really afford to buy it. Not because of the headline price, but the running costs of living there. Because they've never been told until they're committing, emotionally at least, that the service charge is £1,500 £1, a year, the ground rent is £250 a year, it's council tax G for whatever reason, and the council tax is 500 quid a year, and there's no money in the sinking fund, so next year they're going to have to top that up. That, that, we see much more problems in terms of our customer service team dealing with distressed leaseholders, where actually they hadn't really understood what they were buying. And I think if, if one of the things that, um, that we're keen to ensure that this overall leasehold reform agenda does, because as I've mentioned, we support the banning of houses, the eradication of onerous here, here we're And we'll talk about the cost of service charges later. Here we're talking about the cost of the freehold. That, and we, we can't get to the situation. It seems you, you were determined to maintain a position where this process is obscure, one-sided, expensive, complicated. We've got to somehow get away from that. And unless the sector comes up with something that is simpler, fairer and cheaper, then I think you might not have a sector, is the point. Well, we, we would encourage the, 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 the Law Commission to come up with something that's uh, simpler and fairer and more transparent. 
Um, but the current method for working out what the premium is payable on a, on a lease extension is very detailed. It's clearly been thought about by, by, by minds that are far greater than mine um, in, in huge amounts of detail and, and, and is, is, is very clearly written into, in, into, into legislation. Now, you know, the Law Commission is looking at ways uh, of, of making that um, simpler and, and fairer. Um, but I come back to the point that I made earlier. It's complex. It's around it, it, property transactions are the biggest transactions that individuals enter into um, in in their lives, and, and we seek to make it as simple as we possibly can. But you, if you make it too simple, then then there is a risk um, that that, that that there is a risk that. Um, you, you get into mis-selling areas and you can't take something I that think is... we're in those areas already, to be honest. Yeah, you can't take something that is of its nature complex <laughs> yeah, and make it simpler just for the sake of making it simple. No, make it fair. Simple and fair. Uh, I mean, yeah, right. Fair, yes. Okay, so we, 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 we are short of time. We've just got a couple of final points we need to get on to. Three. Um, good afternoon. Um, we've had a lot of evidence um, from leaseholders about service charges. Uh, they, can, they get concerned about a lack of transparency, they say sometimes they're excessive and poor value for money, and also uh, when major works take place as well. Um, so what do you do to make sure that, that when you charge for service charges and for major works that they are value for money and people aren't overcharged? Um, Shall I go ahead yeah. because that's more a managing agent um, area. People do have um, recourse to challenge those. So you have Section 19, you can go through the first tier tribunal. I think that's a separate question of whether A, people actually know about that, because certainly if I talk to friends in the social uh, aspect, they have no idea that there is an ombudsman there, should they wish to challenge it, that there's a first tier tribunal and so forth. So whether those are actually well enough known by people is, is a very interesting question. Um, there are efforts being made to do that. So MHCLG is, is producing currently a leaflet on how to lease. and Armour in association with quite a number of organisations has produced, I think it's about 12 documents for leaseholders trying to help them on various aspects like what is a lease, you know, follow the money, common misconceptions and so forth. So there, there are some recourses there. So do people know about it is one question. Are they accessible and easy? So certainly my own personal experience of going to the FTTP was a non-contested case and the first question the panel said was where's your solicitor? And we're going well we don't need it, we're not contesting it. But the, the inference there was that we had to lawyer up beforehand, which puts it a little beyond the initial sort of hundred pounds fee, because you're suddenly sorting, sorting uh, thousands of pounds. Something else you can look at is the regulation of managing agents, and I know that that's something obviously that's been looked at at the moment. So we as Armour, we have roughly half the managing agents in the country. We expect them to uh, conform to our code of practice, which has transparency in there. We follow the RICS code, obviously. We send in, actually, it is RICS, um, to audit them every three years. We demand to see copies of accounts that they have prepared for service uh, ch service charges for their clients and so forth. So there are things that, that can be done, um, but that requires everybody to do that. Like I said, I can only speak for the half that, that ARM have who have self-regulated themselves. I would... Um Exactly the same point. I mean, uh, the two things that come out from um, Lee Silver's question in their, their bills is A, it's transparency. So you have, like, um, have a, an organisation where people are members. You have to have regulation of managed agents because you know, we hold through independent banks large amounts of, of customers' money. So having a regulatory body has to be right. Um, and I know the government are looking at that. Another point um, where there is um, anyone disputing it. At the moment, the FTT, they're, they're a, a good body there to, to adjudicate that, but it is quite daunting. You go into a panel if you're an individual leaseholder, there is a housing ombudsman, and maybe make more use of that as a, as a sort of for small claims or small disputes. Because it's not always on about the money, it's about you know, what you told me or the timing, or, or other, there's lots of other issues around leasehold that aren't necessarily confrontational, but you maybe can't get an answer, you can't resolve it. And, and the housing ombudsman scheme, some form of that, could be a good answer to it. But, Certainly, visibility. I mean, from the budgeting process, you you know, there has to be a standard format of this is what a budget looks like, so it's clearly readable by absolutely this is what we do day in day out. But it's what the people may see twice a year. So if you can have a budget that's simple, in plain English, sales every single heading, what it costs, what it's for, um, you have an audit account at the end of the year, so it's independently audited, which is what happens now. Again, those accounts go out that are clear and visible, and you can see 
you say it's going to cost hundred pound at the start of the year. If it costs hundred and fifty pound at the end of the year on the audit, and it just and you can have reasoning why there's a difference because it's obviously not a science; it's a an estimate a year before the time. So so that's it's, it's making it much more clearer with standardisation. Do, do you charge percentage management fees on top? No, you no. don't. It's a fixed fee. That's it. No. And that's that's from the well. outset. That's absolutely clear. It's a fixed fee, ten flats, whatever it is, and it's per per unit. Okay. Anything to add? So. Um, where we have management responsibility on, on blocks, we, we appoint a managing agent. We do that from a panel of agents that we use, all of whom we have met. Um, they sign up to our uh, management agreement. They're required to report to us on a quarterly basis. Um, we see their service charge budgets. We see the, the actual spend against that. Um, it enables us to uh, restrict the amount by which uh, they increase their own fees year on year. And we work on the simple premise, which they all understand, which is that if uh, leaseholders are not happy with the standard of management that they get, and they, they come to us as freeholder and say we are not happy, we replace them. Have you done that? Yes. Richard? Very similar way of operating to, to, to Mick, um, although we, when we acquire a block from a developer, um, we're the last pe piece in the jigsaw. Um, so the developer will get planning, build the blocks, appoint a managing agent, sell the flats, and then the freehold will be sold on to us or somebody else. So at the point where we become the freeholder of a block, there's already all the flats have been sold out and the managing agent is incumbent. Our view is that you know we, we're not here to interfere with the peace and harmony of that block as long as it is peaceful and it is harmonious. So um, we have a very broad range of managing agent relationships, over 100, which we, uh, and, and what we have is an estates management team that will effectively provide the rigour and oversight, the reporting, the health and safety, the fire risk assessment reporting to us so that when the building safety team at MACLG asks us how many cladding problems we've got you know, of, of, of late, we're able to tell them pretty quickly. Exactly though, the same, same way as Mick mentioned, if our residents, even on a no-fault basis, contact us and say we're dissatisfied with the service, we will, depending on where the block is, run a tender for three different managing agents to come in and pitch to the residents for, to, 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 to run that block and collaborate with the residents, give, give advice on what we think they should do, but then um, let, let the residents effectively be part of the decision-making process to replace the managing agent. We've heard that uh, high commission charges for insurance products are sometimes hidden within service charges. Do you think that should be prohibited? I think there's yes. Well, yes. I'll agree there. I think there's a basis for a commission on insurance because the other question there is about who otherwise would deal with the claims because okay. generally the management fee is independent of the insurance. So if the managing agent places it, they get a commission and that compensates them for, for looking at Which the claims. Which be shown separately rather than hitting it well, service charge. It should be. I mean, uh, according to Rich, what you have to do is disclose that you are receiving commission. So you have okay. to say this within the um, with a letter adjoining the account. Well, I think the, the point is, is that a lot of managing agents don't take commission. I know it's the perception that residents think they do, but they certainly don't. And as a firm, we don't. Um, a lot of the commission, not so much commission, is hidden. You get lots of insurance placed through brokers, and the brokers deal with the claims handling process. So rather than do it a charge at a point of claim, so if someone makes a claim, you have to generally get three quotes, three tenders, which the managing agent does. There's a cost implication to that. We don't charge that individual lessee for, for that individual customer for that. That's generally, and we don't charge a management fee for that because the broker deals with that. So that's potentially where that alleged commission is. But certainly, that there is an insurance commission for, for most managing agents. Okay. And another piece of evidence we got from people was their dissatisfaction with being charged permission fees. Um, we had one witness who said that she was charged uh, over two and a half thousand pounds for permission to put a conservatory on the back of her house. I mean, that doesn't seem right, does it? Uh, no, and it, no. It, it isn't. It isn't right, and it's. Is there a justification for permission fees? I think there is a, a justification for charging a fair fee where we provide a service. Um, the lease is a is a legal document at the, at the end of the day, um, and to the extent that we have to uh, do work to provide a service, we would charge um, a reasonable fee to cover our costs. Um, but um, the but just to cover the costs, not yes, to. But, the, but the, the level of fees you, you are talking about is it's not something that I recognise. I think it's the um, in in the example I give in blocks of flats where you have if someone in the flat above you does you work. Have the on the block of flats. Well, you couldn't have, but say for instance, quite a common one is is, is changing say the kitchen design. Yeah. So, as managing agent, you have to go in 
obviously acted for the free old, did look at where that's kitchen, because you can't put kitchens over bedrooms no. and that type of thing. So you have to check that that is correct. Wood flooring is another one, that when someone puts in a wood flooring, because the lease coffin says carpeting, um, that there's sand insulation, there's adequate sand. So someone's got to check that. You've got to have an approved specification. You have to sign that off with, with covenants in the, any consent that if that does cause a nuisance, that you can still lay carpet on top. Now, that's a, a cost thing. So that's not so much a fee as, as you say, but it, there's a reasonable cost that, that manager agents on half fields would have to charge to, to be able to grant that consent in the first place. So, I would, I'm sorry, Jim. sorry to interrupt. I, I would make the point that we, we turn a lot of requests like that down. If somebody comes to us and says, I want to put wooden, wooden flooring in my, my apartment, um, as I alluded to earlier, we are there to enforce the covenants on the lease. Um, so we are quite happy to say, no, that is not permissible under the terms of the lease. But there's a difference, isn't there, between recovering a cost and charging a fee? So yeah. what we're talking about here is permission fees, so you don't see a role for those. Um, a, separate, <coughs> a separate fee just for doing something. Well, that, that is usually put in the lease that, um, that sometimes the landlord gets to charge. So again, alluding back to my personal circumstances, that's the, uh, pretty much the only other stream of income that my RMC has, which is um, permission to sublet. So that is always a very hot topic, particularly with Airbnb, um, but <laughs> yeah. very difficult to enforce because you don't really know that somebody is subletting. And then, as, as John says, permission to do something to the flat. So are you going to remove a structural wall? Are you going to say, put a, a toilet above somebody's bathroom and so forth? And that requires the managing agent to go in, look, perhaps bring a surveyor and so forth. So the lease would usually say that a reasonable fee is required for that to, for compensation, and again, you can contest that reasonable fee. Okay. On to contesting issues, a um, lot of evidence that uh, um, occasional leaseholders do contest. They, they find it very difficult because the freeholder or the manager agent comes along with with QCs and, and, and barristers, and they're trying to represent themselves. So it's a bit unequally weighted. Would you favour setting up a housing course as the government's now? Um, consulting on just a very quick response because we've got time um, to try and simplify the process. I would. The proposal that the government's put forward is actually not to do with this, uh, with leasehold in a sense. If you, right. uh, it's 43 pages, which is on about tenants and right. their residential. So you'd, ex you, you'd like to extend it into this area? I as well. would do. Yes. Okay, that's true. And uh, if um, a leaseholder wins a case at tribunal now uh, and gets the costs of the freeholder uh, 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 costs award to the, the freeholder to have to pay. Is it fair then that the leaseholders get charged those costs back in their service charge, which appears to be happening? Uh, under the certain circumstances, no, it wouldn't be. I mean, you can apply but for it a happens. It does. You can apply for a Section 20C. And I, I certainly, if I took my, uh, my landlord to, to court and won and then found that I was paying his costs, I wouldn't so be very happy. You'd like it being banned then that those could be charged back? As long as it's fair, yes. Yeah. Okay. On the other side of the coin, if a leaseholder has been vexatious, I think the, the freeholder should have every right okay. to sort of yeah. say, well, this, is, this has to stop. Just, just, just finally, just to try, try to get to the point. Um, Mr Silver, you, you said that uh, your, your company made, I think, in the end after payments back to the pension fund, £4 million pounds from ground rents. How much of that money actually goes back to maintaining and improving the property and providing service to the leaseholders? Um, or is that your profit? No, the profit uh, is... You know, from, our, from our ground rent uh, uh, management activities is £340,000 a year. That's all you make a year. So that, that is the that profit. The costs of running the uh, freehold management business, so the state's management team, accounting, lawyers, customer service team... To you don't charge that on the service charge, then? No. No, no. Um, is £3.6 million. And the pensioners, from, from the money that we, uh, we, we... We charge permission fees and consent fees for, for various things. Airbnb is a big problem at the moment. Um, the wooden floor syndrome again, where, where we can charge reasonable fees, and reasonable, by the way, in this context, is governed by the law and are challengeable. But th those fees come to you on top th of your th ground rent? So those, those fees are levied by, uh, effectively levied under the lease to the landlord, and then the landlord pays us fees for managing, landlord companies pay us fees for managing their properties. And so the turnover... So that means if you could provide those figures to us, that Yeah, OK, I'll be happy to do and that. Mr Platt, your £11 million, pounds, how much do you actually make on the ground rents? Um, so, so as I said, our £11 million pounds goes to um, it goes to pay the, uh, the pension fund to... How much do you make as a company? So all, uh, our entire operation is covered, as, as Richard just alluded to, by, uh, by consent fees and permission fees. Perhaps you'll give us those figures I as well. I can give you those figures okay. as well, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming to give evidence to the committee this afternoon. Thank you.